uh, first item on the agenda, again, this is for a budget work session, is the Citizens Forum. Uh, Carolyn, can you read the um, announcement, please? Welcome to this meeting of the Centerville Town Council. This is a public meeting and we welcome your participation. By attending, you acknowledge that this session is recorded and aired live on QAC TV 7. During the meeting, we ask that you turn your cell phones off and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. The Town Council respects and appreciates your desire and right to convey your message freely and in keeping with the dignity of proceedings, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. If questions are a part of your comments, we'll refer those to the appropriate individual. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna open up for Citizens Forum. Is there any citizens that'd like to come forward and have uh, be heard for three minutes? Ideally, this is gonna be under the, uh, regarding the budget. We are gonna have a, a regular public forum during uh, the regular time. Joe, I, I, we, we are in uh, public comment. You're good? Okay, all right. Uh, we'll move on to the next discussion. Law enforcement officers pension system. Oh, that's me, sorry. So we, we went over some of the highlights in the closed session and so I, I guess at this point we need to get a motion or decide if you guys want to move forward. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time to, to get back with Patricia, but. Uh, yeah, so my preference would be that we do that kind of by consensus now and then let's put it in the regular agenda uh, to actually make a motion if we're gonna actually pass it. I'm in, I'm in favor of this. I think this is something we've been looking for for a long time and I wanna thank the actuarials for uh, getting it to us uh, in time. Any of my fellow council members have anything they wanna say? Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I don't know how we don't do this and continue to leak our best officers to surrounding okay. jurisdictions. I think the you know, Centerville taxpayer is paying in many cases to train and certify some of these officers and then uh, they get started, get, get going, and then they go work for somebody else where they get a better pension system. So I don't know how we can afford not to do this. Uh, so I would be for it as well. Anybody else? I'm for it. All right. I completely agree. I think it's something that we need to do. Okay. I'm for sure. it. I think right. it's been a long time coming. Yes. I Thank you. Deserve it. Jeff. All right. So that so I think we're good there. We're all uh, consensus is that we want to put that into the in uh, put that on the agenda for our next meeting. Do we have enough time if we put it on our agenda for the next meeting? It, right? Or do we need it tonight? It happened we need it by the twentieth, so we need it by the 20th. We can do it by that. We can do it in that meeting, and then that gives Patricia because we still got to fill out some forms. But we can do that with the consensus. It's going to be tight. What is keeping us from doing it today? Nothing. I mean, I, I typically don't like to add things to an agenda on the night of the meeting. But other than that, I think uh, you know we can bring it up during during the regular meeting if we want during the police. Let's do that. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. Can Thank you me. add that Joe, when you come up for? Yes, okay. yes sir. Uh, all right, Karen, the next part is for you. All right, so, um, you know, we've had four or five work sessions already. We went through the budget. These two copies are just your finals since um, all the changes that have been made. So you got your first one is the operating and your second one is the capital. Um, and they're pretty much the same as the last time, besides the very small little changes discussed last work session. So I don't know how in depth you want to go into these, but I just wanted you to have these copies. Um, and you'll get one more set at the adoption in, in June of it, but tonight is the first reading. So I just wanted to make sure you at least had the, the most current one. Yep, I'm good. The only change that I would want is that- uh, I'll fix Those that. columns, yeah. Yeah, so on the general fund page one, where it says net of red speed, comp payout, capital projects, the lining is off just a little bit, so it, it, um, it, it, they don't line up with the number, so I'll fix that for the, okay. <laughs> for the next one. So the red speed revenues are? Um, the can't speed cameras. Right, what's the number? 20, oh, 25, 25. yep. Right. And the comp is 15 and the projects is the seven. Just, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll make sure by the next one that one's lined up. Yes, so I just wanna real quickly go through the, the ARP funding so 4.132 is the top line that we think anticipate getting We're treating it all as enterprise fund revenue right yeah and so we're taking a hundred thousand dollars out in fiscal 22 for project management correct and so unless what we're spending so we have 
one point zero six two left. Yes. Projects. So if you if you take into account the whole three hundred fifty thousand, we'll have the one oh six two. The one three one two is inclusive not inclusive of the project. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Good. Okay. Anybody else have anything on operating draft or capital draft? We'll now move into the citizens forum again. We've got an opportunity for citizens to again comment. Tim, I did not say this in the beginning. I do have two um, public comments that were emailed in that are related to the tax. Right, and they were they were asked to be public comments. Okay, uh, let's read them. Let's read them now. We're opening up okay. the citizens forum. If you could just identify who they are and. All right. Uh, the first one's uh, Ken Huddleston um, for the town council. Raising property taxes as we are starting the recovery from a global pandemic is unconscionable. We should be looking at ways to decrease spending. In a few years, when our residents get back on their feet, we can discuss tax increases if they are necessary. If the objective is to force resident forced to have residents leave the town limits you're on the right path however i would assume we all want the town to continue to grow and through that growth see additional revenue regards ken huddleston and then i received one from um matthew weeman 115a price street um he requested his comments be read and recorded this evening at the council meeting Dear council members, I wish to express my sincere in indignation toward the proposal to increase the property taxes with Centerville Town proper, within so Centerville Town proper. It is reprehensible that any of you would support this decision at any time, let alone when the members of this town are distanced from the actions of our council as a result of the present pandemic. It is not possible for individuals to appropriately gather to apprise the council of their thoughts. Additionally, some of the individuals this council needs to listen to most are the business owners who are at present facing unprecedented levels of personal and professional stress. As council members, you have been elected to act responsibly and with the best interest of the individuals of this town at the forefront of every action taken. There was a tremendous outpouring of discontent toward the decision to hike water and sewer rates to their recent extremes. Each new member to the council shall be held to the same standard as the president who served on council at that time at the time of that decision. There are no reprieves. The community does not support the increases and I believe will stand in strong opposition to the present proposal. I have rep repeatedly made my claim that the finances of this town are being inappropriately managed. It does not matter that we pass audits. Audits are designed to identify embezzlement, not incompetence. As a business owner myself, I don't have the time to fully vet every grievance I may file and it is not my responsibility to do so. I have elected each of you to carry that burden and it is presumed each of you are willing to bear it fully. It is not the responsibility of the citizens of this town to run the council to bring to fruition the change we wish to fulfill. It is, however, their right to question the decisions of the leaders they have duly elected to, to the task and to take part in the decision-making process. In doing so, they must be provided with the information necessary to facilitate the task. This is not political. It is not personal. This is political. It is not personal. I respect each of you as neighbors. I wish to make it clear, however, I believe there is fundamental mismanagement of our town finances at multiple levels, and to make up for it, a new council has decided they would rather seek inputs than make the necessary difficult decisions to minimize the outputs. The inability of the prior council to foresee and prevent the issues that arose with the commerce and Liberty Street construction project is one example of failed leadership and it is one of the more notorious acts that has attracted my ire because it has undoubtedly compromised the future viability of this town, a place I really care about. It is my understanding the prior councils may have neglected the infrastructure and more recent ones were complicit with the planning failures. Unplanned expedition of the project led to a series of expensive pitfalls and have cost the town significantly. At a council meeting I attended, Mr. McCleskey informed me that we had to fix the failing sewer infrastructure because influx of rainwater was causing us to process excessive volume leading to added cost. 
How has this worked out for us? We have achieved reduced processing loads at the processing plant, or is it possible our waste processing demand has actually increased and has therefore led to yet additional expense to bear? Is the town making certain they hire competent and qualified contractors? Is the town holding to account those who should be held responsible for costly problems? For instance, are the residents of Northbrook still drinking arsenic-laden brown water? And if so, why are the developers who laid the pipes not being held responsible for the investigation and appropriate repairs. A new development proposal is on the agenda this evening. We can assure those developing this project will be held responsible for any mishaps of their creation that impact the town financially. Is council going to make sure we can afford the expense of this development? I don't appreciate the argument that we increase the tax base with development. This may be true, but from what I can see in a county with the best yet most expensive school system, it's pretty difficult to expect a net revenue increase of this development will consist of families with school aged children. It's further difficult for me to believe the development will improve the situation of our town's finances when we can't afford to upkeep the present infrastructure. The costs that stem from the malpractice of consultants and development contractors is not a cost I as a taxpayer and willing to bear. I also wish to make it clear to the council members who repeatedly vote to support philanthropic spending that it is taxpayer dollars they're spending. The taxpayers of this town can choose their philanthropic, I have a hard time with that word, philanthropic endeavors and it is not the business of this council to approve any philanthropic spending, especially when we can't afford our basic necessities. Last year, council told us that in order to be lifted from the burden of the mismanaged construction project, we were promised that liquidation of the rainy day fund would prevent tax <coughs> increases. Is it the desire of this council to make it clear to the town at large their word and their actions should be regarded as a feckless new standard? It is not possible for us to find a new solution that carries us forward. What precisely is the need for a 32% property tax increase as real property tax revenues are increasing on account of appraisal levels? Raising rates to make us com comparable to other local municipalities may seem reasonable only when the community has the infrastructure available to support the growth of local businesses who may benefit from appropriations, increase increased tourism, etc. This is not the case for Centerville at present. We don't even have a hotel to support an influx of tourism or visitors. I am disheartened to see such minimal thought process to such critical decisions. No, I do not know how much thought each of you have actually committed to the task and perhaps my oversimplification will be considered offensive. What I do know is the outcome of your decision is not appropriate or satisfactory, so it is my intent to send you back to the drawing board regardless of how you came to this conclusion. I am rejecting your decision. I am counting three individuals with the responsibility of managing the town, town finances within the directory uh, listing. What exactly are you doing? What is our town manager doing? And what are each of you doing to ensure the responsibilities are being met? At the, end of the, that, at the end of the day, there must be a level of accountability and why I really don't wish to be the one to provide it. If this council and the managers of this town wishes to continue to attract my attention by provoking me <coughs> with egregious rate increases after I adjust my schedule to accommodate the devotion of time to this matter, may, May each responsible party rest assured I will devote my attention fully to it. Can, can I interrupt you there for a second? We, you know, we're trying to do three minutes. We're already about six in, and this is only about halfway done. Yeah. So let's put the rest in the record, for, you know, as as it, written as we would typically for the rest. <coughs> is there anybody else that has any uh, comments on Citizens Forum regarding the budget work session? All right. Hearing none, I'm going to. I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 We got about uh, four minutes until the regular meeting. George, you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Taking a break? Jeff. Yeah, we'll take a break until 7 o'clock.
Oh, whatever. I'm going to wait for George. George, we're on. Sorry. I'm going to convene the uh, town council meeting for May 6, 2021. If you would please uh, stand with me and, and do the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing for a moment of silence for military and public safety personnel, past and present. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. First thing, uh, we're gonna go through the review of minutes from uh, past uh, April 15, 2021 budget work session minutes. I have one change on the budget work session minutes. The final bullet uh, right before buy and right, or right after buy and right before consensus, I'd like it to change to say unanimous consensus. That was one that was unanimous, final bullet. I don't have any other changes. I'll accept the motion to it. The motion that we accept the, or approve the minutes for the April 15th budget work session as amended by President McCluskey. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Next we have April 15th, 2021 meeting minutes. I don't have any changes. I'll make a motion that we accept the April 15th, 2021 meeting minutes as uh, presented. Take second. It. We have a motion and a second uh, to approve the April 15, 2021 meeting minutes. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Closed session. I have two announcements to read. Uh, t closed session announcement regarding town council closed session April 29th, 2021. The town council met in closed session on Thursday, April 29th, 2021 at 7.03 p.m. at the Centerville Wharf Building, 101 Waterway, Watson Road, to discuss personnel in accordance with the Maryland Open Meetings Act. Four members of the town council voted to close the session. The authority to close the session is found in section 3-305 of the general provisions article. The town council discussed the following topics. Personnel. Discuss personnel evaluation and compensation of employees. Actions. No action were taken. The following members and staff were present. Timothy E. McCluskey, President, Stephen K. Klein, Vice President, Jeffrey D. Keel, and Shelby Ananiah, members, and Steve Walls, Town Manager. The meeting adjourned at 7.48 p.m. Steve Walls was not present. <laughs> Crystal. This was last time. The, the, that, this is April 29th. Last this first. is Sorry. the one the, the one for tonight. I thought we were that tonight. <laughs> Closed session announcement regarding town council closed session, May 6, 2021. The town council met in closed session on Thursday, May 6, 2021 at 6.15 p.m. at the Liberty Building, 107 North Liberty Street, second floor meeting room to discuss personnel in accordance with the Maryland Open Meetings Act. All five members of the town council voted to close the session. The authority to close the session is found in section 3-305 of the general provisions article. The town council discussed the following topics. Personnel to discuss compensation of employees and appointment of personnel that affects one or more specific individuals. Actions, no actions were taken. The following members and staff were present. Timothy E. McCluskey, President, Stephen K. Klein, Vice President, Robert R. Hardy, Jr., Jeffrey D. Keel, and Shelby C. Ananiah, members. Crystal Ebaugh, Acting Town, Ma uh, Town Manager, Chief Joe Sabori, Centerville Police Department, William Chapman, Acting Town Attorney, and Karen Luffman, Finance Officer. The meeting adjourned at 6.36 p.m. All right. Next, we're going to move into Citizens Forum. Uh, Carolyn, would you read uh, the notice, please? Welcome to this meeting of the Centerville Town Council. This is a public meeting, and we welcome your participation. By attending, you'll acknowledge that this session is recorded and aired live on QAC TV 7. During the meeting, we ask that you turn your cell phones off and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. The scheduled agenda is available on the information table just outside. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. The town council respects and appreciates your desire and right to convey your message freely. And in keeping with the dignity of proceedings, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. If questions are a part of your comments, we will refer those to the appropriate individual. Thank you. All right, so uh, we've got a couple of emails that I need to read here as well that came through. Well, why don't we do the live people first? If there's anybody that wants to make a public comment, uh, come on up, identify who you are, and do we have a, do we have a list that's, uh, that's signed up? Why don't we do, if there's anybody signed up, why don't we do the list first, and then we'll do anybody else who's not, and then I'll read the emails. All right, first we have Priscilla Molesky. You can still come up when he asks. Yep. Hi, 
Um, you say, state your name and then uh, your address. Okay, my name is Priscilla Molesky. I'm at 93 Happy Lady Lane. I am the vice chairperson for the Centerville Parks Advisory Board. And we, um, I just want to express our great concern about the um, what's going on with the Carter property and the possibility that they're looking at not going through with the trail or no stream trail system continuing along the, um, the waterfront there. And I strongly want to recommend that we uphold that, um, you know, what the town has already said wanted to be done along the edge of that property. I think it's such a great asset to our community and our town that all the people in the town and our community have access to the water and the beauty of the nature that surrounds us. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Next, we have Fred McNeil. Thank you. I'd like to also speak on the. Uh, Can you just come up and say your name and your address, Fred please? McNeil, 402 Chesterfield Ave. Uh, I'd like to speak briefly on two things. One, the Carter property, and in fairness in advertising, my backyard bound, is boundary is the Carter property. And I'm glad somebody's going to develop it, and it looks like a very good plan. But I think we have to stay with the Centerville Master Plan and make sure the nature walk is included for a couple reasons. One, a great article in the Washington Post Sunday, completed trail network may be a $1 billion boom. Now, we're not, we're not going to say, obviously, a billion dollars in Centerville, but the idea, if you have a nature trail, it becomes a community asset. It's also, it's going to help Joe and the police force. It's more eyes out watching property. People fussed about, well, the trail will be in the back, my backyard. It will be in my backyard, and we know from Ken Island Trail, whether it's Four Seasons or any developments down there, doesn't hurt having that trail go right behind where you live, okay? You're still protected, but it's more eyes watching the property and protecting the community. The Post article, if I can go back to that, talks about the social, economic, all types of issues that trails are terribly re relevant and very important to the community. And last thing on the trail project, People currently use their trails already there. If you've never been back there, come knock on my front door. I'll walk you around. There are trails that go around the Carter property into the woods, all the way down to the far end of the Carter property, all the way to the Board of Ed property. It's currently being used by people walking dogs. There's at least a dozen people, myself included, walking dogs back there every day. So if I can, please stay with the comprehensive plan or the master plan. It's a great plan, and the trail is a great idea. Now, the last thing I'm, I'm going to talk about, and then uh, you got to raise taxes. I'm sorry. Uh, I heard the comments we've had earlier. Tragic, this tragic pandemic has taught us a lesson as a nation. Government in times of emergencies and times of stress have to come in and help the communities. We have to have more services here. We're going to grow. We have to improve the services we have. You guys are doing a great job, and ladies, our employees are doing a great job, but it's going to cost more to do services we need. So please raise taxes. People are going to fuss at you. They always do. Americans don't like taxes. Americans are the most undertaxed people in the world compared to Europe, compared to other countries. Uh, we're not even in the same ball game. So anyway, please uh, thank you for the time. You're all doing a great job. Uh, please can keep that trail on the Carter property. And you can come, if you want a tour of the Carter property, I'd be delighted to take any time. And please raise taxes and protect this town, the beautiful town we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, next we have Frederick Bowe. You, excuse me. You, almost you. I apologize. I was getting ready. Thank you. Uh, we were no, you can take that off if you want. Just identify yourself and where you live, please. Yes. So, uh, Frederick Bue, uh, 510 Chesterfield Avenue. Um, the old wharf house um, about a block from uh, the Carter farm and I'm going to refer to the proposal that uh, I was able to get a copy of and that's really my comments uh, not about taxes so it's uh, uh, I'm going in a different direction uh, and, and instead of taking notes uh, I just wanted to follow through on their proposal I didn't have a chance to hear their presentation or to really know what their rationale is for their their proposal or their ideas i'm going to try to stick to the three minute if, if not throw something at me uh, the comprehensive plan i think is something that uh, my understanding is that it's been in force uh, with the this trail along that perimeter area since at least 1998 and with each renewal 
has continued to be uh, a part of that plan. I think it's so critical to our community uh, to pay attention to not only the natural resources, but also uh, the historic character of our community and that we uh, adhere to that. And some things I think really need to be sacred. And I hope you still have the faith around what the forefathers of our community have laid down, have put down with a lot of discussion, you know, that we really pay attention to what was in the comprehensive plan. It wasn't just something that was <coughs> made up and then passed and approved over and over again. Um, it's been out there for at least 25, 30 years now, and it's still just vitally important I think to the community. If anybody walks, in, and I have all kinds of friends, and we use it all the time on the Millstream uh, Trail. We kayak up and down uh, the headwaters of the Corsica, Corsica. We overlook that from our backyard. So it's really important to us, but I think it's important to the community that haven't had the opportunity to go in his backyard and, and walk through that because it's just such a beautiful, spectacular area. And it's really something that's just fundamental. And, and I hope as a new town council that you take this opportunity to really stay strong with what's really important to our community. Uh, again, yeah, I understand I come from business for 45 years. I understand profitability and, you know, and I've invested in real estate over the years. And I know that looking at their proposal, that there are with just a little imagination that there's lots of ways that they can retain you know, it, it's a pretty high density uh, um, type of uh, development. You know, we're looking at 125 homes, fairly small, 50, you know, 1,300 to you know, 2,000 uh, square feet. As most of the homes, there's a, you know less than 8 percent, maybe a little bit larger than that. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of tax revenue that can come to the town. They can also be profitable. I know, with just a little imagination to reimagine how they're going to. Uh, stay true to the original plan. Am I out here? F Fred, if I could, uh, so the perimeter trail is important or just a trail on the, the property? perimeter trail? Running the trail with their plan down the parking lot in front of all the buildings and stuff is silly. I mean, it's insulting, I think, to consider that still as a nature trail or a part of our park system. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous. It's insulting. Perfect. So, uh, Unfortunately, I'll shut up. I don't, I don't shut up well, <laughs> but uh, I will. Thank you. But Thank you for coming. Please make the right decision. It's important. Uh, next, we have Sandy Simpson. I'm Sandy Simpson. I live at 119 Walnut Street. I'm a member of the Park Advisory Board, and I strongly urge the Town Council to require <clears throat> the new developer to include the perimeter trail and honor the town's comprehensive plan that has long included the trail in all planning do documents. Um, during a previous developer's proposal application, the State Critical Area Commission deemed the perimeter trail a required public amenity as a condition of approval. I'd like that to be honored. All citizens of Centerville should be able to enjoy this wonderful trail. I'd like to start at Mill Stream and go down to the wharf and continue going all the way, hopefully, around the town as we once planned to do and we hope to do. It will be an environmentally wonderful, scenic experience for everyone, and I hope you will maintain the peripheral trail. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next, we have Carrie Lee O'Connor. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, my name is Carrie O'Connor. I live at 602 Little Kidwell Avenue. And I am just here to say 25 years we have been talking about this trail. And um, I guess I come to this angle as a social worker and I speak to the health of communities. Um, you have health, you have health, you have health. Well, communities have health. And part of what makes communities healthy are um, opportunities for citizens to, to gather and to walk and to enjoy the beautiful scenery that we have all around us. We live in a wonder world and it's not 
in everyone's best interest to take away these views because there might be a higher profit in the immediate gratification point in time now. I think we have to look at long-term planning and you have this beautiful opportunity to do that right now. Just as Sandy mentioned, it would be something where it would encircle the entire town. So I just urge you all to please consider including the perimeter trail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Carrie York. I just was going to say, this is who I am. I sent you all an email, so I don't need to say anything other than I really think that perimeter trail is extremely important. And this is the time to do it. You want me to read that, or do you want to read it? You can read it, Tim. All right, I'll read it when we do the rest of them. Okay, that would okay. be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Bob McGrory. Good evening, council members. Nice to see you all. Uh, I think the last time I was here testifying was in favor of the expanded sidewalk, and I just want to thank you all for making that happen. Uh, as COVID starts winding down and the weather warms up, I think people are going to be using it, and that's fantastic. So kudos for having the courage to do that. Um, and I want to also talk about the Carter Farm and the Perimeter Trail, very much in favor. My very first trip to Centerville was to attend a meeting in 2006 of the Centerville Comprehensive Plan Citizens Advisory Committee. And uh, that group put in a ton of work over many years, working with the Town Council, the Planning Commission, uh, the County Planning Commission, and the County Commissioners. It was adopted by all those bodies and had tons of citizen input including from the Carter family. And it reaffirmed the importance of this perimeter trail, um, which was carryover from the 1998 comprehensive plan. So I just want to add that developers will frequently say, we can't live without this particular amenity. And uh, citizens of Centerville knew differently when they adopted and encouraged the town council to adopt the comprehensive plan. And I hope you will also uh, reaffirm that. Um, so I think it's absolutely critical that the citizens of your community have a trail along the water. And uh, I look forward to seeing that property uh, be developed. It'll add traffic, certainly in my neighborhood, but it's absolutely consistent with smart growth. And uh, I encourage you to adopt it with the changes proposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's everybody that I have signed up. Now, if there's anybody else that wants to speak, uh, you, Joe, why don't you come up first, and then we'll, we'll take anybody else who uh, is in the room, and then we'll get some people who are out of the room. I have some things that I want to bring to Can you introduce yourself first, please, and, and just say where you live? And, Joe, you're going to have to talk. The people on TV can't hear you if you're not talking into the microphone. Okay. My name is Joe Brown. I live on uh, Chatterwell Avenue in Centerville. Um, I have something I want to share with the council. I don't have a copy here. Everybody I'll come get it, Joe. I'll come get it. You'll have to share a little bit. Um, Got to do the limbo. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I have two copies if you want to start one one side, one the other. Thank you, Steve. So I, I come before the council to bring to your attention the condition of some of the properties um, here in Centerville. The, the pictures that uh, I'm sending around, the yellow building is 100 Liberty Street. Uh, you'll notice that there's um, a lot of trash. There's uh, The building isn't being kept up. And now in the last month or so, this mattress has shown up. It seems to found a home there. Um, the building uh, next to it on West Water Street um, is the gray building. And um, that you can see the paint peeling, and and it's not kept in good repair, and trash out all over the streets all week long. And uh, I mean, it cans, but they're out on the street all week long. Uh, if you look at the yellow building, you know they painted one shutter, they started painting it black. I guess they had a short ladder, they couldn't get up all the way to the top of the shutter, so the top of it's green, and it's just a, it's not a pretty situation. Um, these properties are one and a half blocks from Town Hall, okay. Somebody could take an afternoon lunch and walk by there and see what's going on. Um, so when I see this, what I see is a lack of pride in this town that we're not we're allowing this to keep going on. 
I see a lack of leadership that we're not doing something about it. Um, the owner of these two properties lives in Graysonville. Okay, it's for, I see a for sale sign on the property now. So I, I don't see why we would um, allow somebody to live that, uh, have a property stay in that condition. Um, it makes you think you're in Baltimore City, um, not in, uh, in uh, Centerville and Queen Anne's County. Um, I don't think I would call that quaint. A lot of people say this is a quaint town. That's not quaint at all. It needs attention. Okay. And by the way, these aren't the only properties in town that are in disrepair. So if we can't maintain what we got, um, you know, what are we talking about doing something new doesn't make any sense until we take care of what we got. And it's up to the citizens that own this. A lot of them don't live in town. So, um, I, I'd like to see the council and the town manager do something about it. Appreciate those comments. I will, I will add to that, that one of the things we do have added into the budget is a part-time uh, um, code enforcement officer. We have not had that, and we don't have the labor currently to do that, but that's one of the things that we you are going to address. I think the people that are here could do some of that sometimes. I mean, it's a block and a half from here, okay? you got to be driving around this town. you got to see stuff. You got to hire somebody to do that? No, you can. It could have happened a long time ago. This didn't just start. It's been going on, yep. and it's not just there. It's other places in town. Joe, you know the grass grows, and we can't get it cut. We see. Joe, we you grow. said people no. here. I don't know what you mean. Who's people? The town council. You guys drive through town. You can see that. The town manager drives through town. I mean, I do know there's been a letter sent to the property owner. What's that? There can has I, been a letter sent to the property owner. Well, can I changed. actually can I actually speak about the building on the corner here? It actually was just sold this week. They went to settlement yeah. and they actually just got a fifteen thousand dollar facade grant for it. So <laughs> just so you know, they, they it's been for sale. He hasn't been able to sell it. So I know there was a rumor one time it was for sold and then it, for sale. I mean that was sold and then it didn't Yeah, they went to settlement this week on it. They've been actually working on the whole project. They've already submitted plans to the but, you know, the facade grant seems like a waste on a property like that where it's just been neglected. And so then they go get free money to do that. I mean, I don't see why we let it get... So it's that. not the current owner, Joe, is what Carolyn is saying. It's the new owner, and we're trying to promote, I would think, with that many grants, correct? The facade. Yes, it's the state facade money grants. We get. Yeah. Yes. So it will. It sounds like, to me, it's, it's going to change. Well, that's what we need. And, and, need to and in the six. fiscal year... 22 bu two budget, like uh, Chairman uh, McCluskey said, uh, we have uh, brought back a code enforcement officer, which previous councils eliminated. So we're moving forward. This whole budget is moving forward. We were elected October. Everything is in the past. So I appreciate everybody's support of us that you elected four new council members, and we rigorously went through this budget and one of the things is budget. to have the code enforcement All right, let's not have a back and forth Let, yeah. let's let's move on to the next uh, public uh, comment um, Royce did you want to come up please come up identify yourself and then uh, you, did you have a public comment yes I do. All right. do you know how to you know, you know what we need for the record my name is Royce Herman uh, I live on Hope Road in Centerville Heights um, some of you know me, some of you may not, but um, my background, I was 40 years with major, major corporations in sales and marketing, and I, I also hold degrees in economics and political science from two schools. And second year economics, I just want to remind it, if I was going to keep my mouth shut tonight, I really was, but Fred kind of uh, <laughs> threw my switches. Um, what I was going to say, I just lost my train of thought and I should have written it down. But anyway, um, tax revenue in the, in the long run is inversely proportional to tax, re, um, tax receipts, okay? In the short run, yeah, you'll see a bump in tax, tax revenue over the first year. In the long run, you're going to lose money raising taxes beyond what you have to spend for public services. In other words, your fire and police and that sort of thing. But that's pretty much a, a given. And now, our friendly Democrats, and I apologize if any of you are Democrats, 
but uh, Fred, I know, is an incurable one. <laughs> really, I mean, come on. He um, has no concept of economics, but that's what's going to happen. So choose wisely when you're raising taxes, because uh, we're just recovering from a, from a pandemic which hit us very hard, hit everybody. And in order to recover from that, the fastest way to recover, obviously, is to reduce taxes, but we can't do that all the time. And I ask you this, that when you're considering the, your tax base, make sure you choose wisely. And don't, don't go hog wild and think you're going to make a lot of money on it, because you, what, what happens is you lose business, and you lose business opportunities by doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody outside that wants to uh, come on in? Yeah, come on in. State your name and where you live, and you've got three minutes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron Willis. I live at 114 Front Street here in town, and I'm here to uh, give you my thoughts on the Carter Farm. Um, you know, waterfront is a really important commodity in this area, and the town has some access to that. And I think it would be an absolute shame to take a nice piece of waterfront area that our town and our citizens should have access to. It's been in the comp plan for 20 something years to have access to at some point and to potentially have the town and the citizens of the town lose access to that forever uh, by the decisions you guys are going to make regarding this development. Uh, we've got a looks on paper like a great development, good, a good plan. Um, I don't know why they can't incorporate the original plan for this perimeter trail. I would suspect in their marketing advertising to try and sell the homes, they're going to market how great the Millstream Trail is and the other amenities that town has while they're eliminating one of the amenities the people that are already here in town were supposed to have. And I think that would be a shame. Um, that plan is, with that trail, it's going to provide continuity continuity with the community. Um, for those that aren't familiar with every road in town, I live on Front Street, which is right down there on the water. The Millstream goes right in front of my house. Um, I see anywhere from a handful of people to 30 or 40 people a day, sometimes more, enjoying the Millstream Trail and walking past in front of my house. And I can say that uh, I don't find in any way that it's a negative that there are people walking in front of my house. It makes me feel like I'm not alone and I'm part of this community. And that's one of the reasons we moved out here was to be part of a community. Um, I can't imagine that this development is going to lose any ability to sell these properties or devalue those homes that are already fairly small and, and designed to be very close together and not have a lot of privacy to begin with are going to really lose a lot of value by having a trail going behind their house that the rest of the community is going to be able to use and they're going to be able to use it themselves. Right? We've got potentially a couple hundred new people moving into town that don't even get to voice their opinion yet on whether or not they would want to have that trail in their own backyard and use it and I think they would. Um, so I'm here to say that I think that that trail is really, really vital and important to the process of, of this development and how that development's going to fit into the existing community and how the new people and the existing people are going to want to utilize that. And this is really your only chance to make a decision on this because if you vote in favor to let them not put that trail in, the option of that trail's gone forever. It's, we're not going to get a second chance at that. And I, I don't think that 10 years from now or 20 years from now, the developers or the people that are there are going to be as concerned about how much money the developers could make or not make off of a particular development because of the trail. The community is going to be thriving and happy because they've been able to continue to use this trail that should be in place that's been part of the plan. And I hope that plan gets to get, to get to put forward. And I'm sure that we have plenty of examples locally all over the state of other communities that have put perimeter trails in um, and it has not been detrimental to the property values it has not been detrimental to the developers at all uh, we haven't seen any place where 
that I can I can look to with uh, Gibson's Grant or over in Bay Ridge, Annapolis Landing, all these different communities that that part of their comp plan was to have a, a trail around the perimeter, and people are using it and enjoying it, and the not just the community, but the people that actually live there are, are enjoying it and and value it as well. So I just urge you to really stick up for the town stick up for that resource that we have that everybody should get to use and make sure that that stays part of the plan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, uh, a point of information. Um, the Planning Commission, they, uh, before they pass it to us, they have the approval of... Well, the, 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 let's, let's get through the public comment. No, 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 no I'm just about saying. It. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else outside or inside that, that wants to make public comment uh, for this? Yep, come on in. State your name, where you live, and you got three minutes. Absolutely. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Holdgreave. I live at 501 Chesterfield Avenue. Um, I'm a senior at Queen Anne's County High School, um, and I'm also a member of the Parks Advisory Board here in Centerville. Um, that's not why I've come to talk to you tonight. Uh, you've heard from multiple, a multitude of people tonight about the uh, Carter Trail and the Carter property, um, and I'm here to voice my opinion on that and give a youth perspective on what I see uh, the benefits are of such a perimeter trail for the youth in our community. Um, I think it's imperative that we continue to develop the green spaces around Centerville. Uh, our youth use these daily. I know, you know, from morning runs to you know, first dates, these trails are an important part of our lives. Um, so I think it would be foolish of the town council not to fight for this trail. Um, I think the community needs to come first in this instance. And I think we really need to preserve the green space. I won't take up too much more of your time um, because I know, you know, we got a lot of public comments here, got a lot of things to do. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that the, the youth perspective was heard and understood here um, because the youth in our community really have a great, uh, a great resource with these trails and these parks. And I think they need to continue to be developed um, and sustained. So I hope you take that into account. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right, is there anybody else here that's uh, in person that has any interest in speaking? Otherwise, I'm going to move to some of these. Uh, I got a few uh, emails that came in for public comment. All right, I'll do my best. <laughs> First is uh, from Carrie York, who actually came here earlier. Um, to members of the town council, my name is Carolyn York, and I reside at 102 Watson Road, purchasing Nancy Hammond's house last fall. I moved to Centerville after living over 50 years in Colorado in January. My daughter and family live in Northbrook, and I have been visiting my new town at least twice a year for 15 years. Near, needless to say, I really do like Centerville with its unique character. That said, I have become aware of the proposed development of the Carter Farm and would urge the council to vote in favor of requiring the developer to include the perimeter trail. It is my understanding that the perimeter trail was part of a comprehensive plan from 1998 and the State Critical Area Commission required the trail as a public amenity for approval. Constructing the trail at the same time when the homes are being built would be economically efficient. I believe it is vital to provide this trail to provide more access to the extraordinary views from the property, let alone the physical exercise the trail provides. I have, I have few complaints, but I will say Maryland is sorely lacking in what I call parks and recreation amenities compared to Colorado, where each county provides trails, pools, and recreation facilities. This is a perfect location to continue providing trails along, those, along with those that already exist, such as Millstream. Thank you, and I'll introduce myself at the meeting. Uh, next, we have uh, an email from George Sigler, a resident. Um, I, urge, I urge each of you to envision a trail system that will encircle this great community from the Wharf Park along Carter Farm to Northbrook, to Providence Farms, to Symphony Village, and tied to the Millstream Park. A continuous trail encircling our growing community. Please do not allow a developer to end this 25 plus year plan to provide for the enjoyment of all the residents of Centerville. Previous development proposals included the perimeter trail, and it was included when they made an application to the state Critical Area Commission for a growth allocation. The Critical Area Commission deemed the perimeter trail a required public amenity as a condition of approval. Please look beyond the now and look to the future of Centerville. Uh, next, we have Patrick Kelly, professional horticulturist on Hope Road. I, currently I, curr I am currently retired from a 25 plus year career at Anne Arundel County Parks Department, Division of Cultural and Natural Resources as county horticulturist, which involved a diverse operation and management of historical, environmental, cultural, park, and recreation facilities focus, as well as greenways and trails. It is, this, it is in this latter area that I would like to comment 
regarding the current development proposal for Centerville's Carter Farm. I was impressed at the depth and scope of the vision that the Green Development slash Remake Group placed in the unique agricultural and historical preservation potential of Carter Farm. Centerville welcomes new residents and exciting progressive smart development to bolster its diverse cultural and economic community. Town is composed of a broad palette, ver veritable new lifetimes of experiences and relationships, unique ingredients that are common discussion of daily social media, as well identified in the foundation of comprehensive community planning going back to 2009. After timely study of the plan descriptive and graphics, I was most disappointed and downright alarmed that the Carter development proposal appears to shortchange and rewrite the Centerville Comprehensive Community Greenways Plan by inconsistently including, downplaying, portraying, or eliminating altogether the much loved, utilized, and publicized greenway trails on conceptual images, incorrectly identifying elements as proposed, and while effusely describing efforts for community connectivity actually isolating Carter Farm in much the same manner that occurred with poor planning of Northbrook community development and resulting complaints by its residents. I feel the lack of community in the Greenways plan and perimeter trail undermines some degree of authenticity to the vision of the developers, the development package, as well as to present to the town council, as they present to the town council, undermines and robs new residents of Carter Farm as well as the town of Centerville basic fundamentals sought by towns and com communities via Greenways. Take non-obtrusive advantage of linear riverfront buffer for green space and connect to nature, the environment, and its amenities. Accommodate bikers, hikers, joggers, handicapped access, and recreation, both individual or events. Generate business, district, economic activity, and community value. Improve bicycle and pedestrian transportation. Improve property values. Generate trail tourism, such as the annual bicycle tours through the areas, hikes, nature walks, birding clubs. Provide outdoor classrooms for study and physical education for students such as Wide River Upper School, Centerville Elementary School, and QA County High School. Site-specific form an integral continuing link between the neighboring communities in Carter Farm, Carter Farm and Wharf Park, Northbrook and Carter Farm and Wharf Park and Millstream Trail section. In short order, it will become Northbrook Symphony Village to the business park to the rail trail. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit more, and I'll put that in for uh, council members to read. All right, we have another one here from Deb Sigler uh, on Windsor. I've been a town citizen since 1992. I used to rent the home next to Judge Carter's home, and he was such a wonderful neighbor. Hearing that the developer of the Carter Farm is proposing not to include a perimeter trail, which has been in the comprehensive plan since 1998, is sad news. We will be losing a scenic walkway, walkway that belongs in the plan. This property has been one of the most stunning viewscapes, and that is one of the reasons that for almost 25 years, the Parks Advisory Board, the Planning Commission, and the Town Council have included this on the trail on all planning documents. I and so many Centerville families love to utilize these trails. We bike, walk, push stro baby strollers, walk our dogs on them. These trails are for the citizens and visitors to the area. They will be here for generations to use and enjoy. Please consider keeping the perimeter trail in the plan. I think I'm not the only one who would enjoy the view of the water instead of the view of the new homes. I'd like to see the trails connecting at some point so we can walk, bike all over the sweet town we call home. Uh, I have a couple of other quick ones here. This is from Mary Margaret Goodwin, uh, a resident on North Commerce. This is the first I have heard about this. Unacceptable not to have the path that has been long in the waiting. Below is my comment for tonight's meeting. If possible, I cannot be there. The Chesterfield property was the heart of the beginning of Centerville. It has been neglected for all these recent years and deserves the town to fight for it. The issue of the continent continuation of the trail system has been a part of the plan for its development since the town began coming together to develop a community plan. For anyone, town council included, to now come in and change this concept of the hiking and biking trail is going against what the town has agreed upon its, as best for its citizens for years. This idea has, has to be met with considerable commitment to keep what the town and the citizens have already decided. Over the years, developers have made promises not kept, took actions that were not acceptable, and in some cases likely not legal. But for someone to tell us, the town, that a community plan long decided and waiting for implementation will not be done is unacceptable. The town council has the responsibility to support decisions made long ago that were agreed upon by the community, even when most of those on the town council were not here for the community planning meetings. Uh, next is Justin Asher, a resident. To not allow a walking path in the new development is unacceptable. No person should be denied the beauty of our town, and there is no reason a trail should not be put in. It makes me question the ethics of the council, and it is looking out for the best interests of the citizens it should serve. Uh, next, we have Lucy Ickes Marks, who lives on Chesterfield and is a resident. Dear Centerville Town Council members, I'm writing in reference to the development plan and proposal for the former Carter property, also formerly known as the Chesterfield Farm, 
located on Chesterfield Avenue. The current proposal for that property is leaving out a crucial element, the perimeter trail, which has been a part of the town's comprehensive plan for many, many years. While I understand two lookout areas are included in the plan, I strongly disagree that this is an adequate or equal replacement of the previously required perimeter trail. I live just up the street from this property and I can attest that this part of town is probably the most desirable walking area within town limits. Each and every day I see the people with strollers and dogs walking and running along this route. I see school groups traveling as a class and cross country teams running this route daily. I see people coming into town, park down at the wharf and venture through the Chesterfield sidewalks and along the tree line crossing behind the back of the Board of Ed property. The perimeter trail would be a natural expansion and connection to the public wharf board boardwalk area as well as the Millstream Trail. We should not be minimizing and eliminating public walking and viewing areas but rather expanding them. Increasing our town's trails, greenways and open spaces provide opportunities for economic growth and renewal as well as preservation and protection to this valuable environmental area. We should want our town to be even more walkable for our residents and visitors. The long-term benefits for this perimeter trail far outweigh any short-term financial gains the developer might be seeking. I urge you to consider requiring a perimeter trail for the current and future development parts plans for the above stated property. Thank you for taking my comments into consideration. That's everybody that I have. I don't think there's any other uh, public comment. Um, so I will close that unless, Bob, you wanted an answer on, do you want an answer on oh, how, the, how it works? The Planning Commission, I, my understanding is before we get to vote, the developer comes before the Planning Commission. Well, the, the, the Planning, planning Commission would be required, their requirement is to approve a subdivision plan and a site plan. Yes. And that may or may not include a, a trail, right? Right. The council are the ones that ultimately would have the, uh, could have the requirement to require a trail because this property is in the critical area and they're gonna be asking for uh, a transfer from a, a growth allocation from right. limited development to intensely developed, and, and the council could be the ones that would be the ones that would be responsible. Okay, and then they have to go through a number of steps, Correct. which is the critical area. The town would actually be going through that. We actually have to have a public hearing. We have to pass an ordinance. Uh, but then right, I'm just telling, I'm just telling you how it works, okay. right? They don't go before the, the, the critical area commission. The town does that. Oh, on their okay, behalf. thank yeah. you. Thank you. Because it's our growth allocation that we're asking for. Got it. All so, right, I'm gonna close Citizens Forum. Next, we have a public hearing. Uh, ordinance 05 2021 text amendment buffer yard requirements for non-single family dwellings in residential zones i will read this as well the subject of this hearing is an ordinance of the town council of centerville to amend the town zoning ordinance codified as chapter 170 of the town code to create setback and buffer yard requirements between new uses and existing single family detached residences in the r1 and r2 zoning districts and any non-residential use in the r3 zoning distance uh, i'm uh, zoning district excuse me I'm gonna now provide some background on Ordinance 05-2021. So this is a result of, we were considering, we've been considering a text amendment to allow for museums in certain residential districts. And one of the concerns was what the buffer yards would require. Uh, the original ordinance uh, for, the, for that, that text amendment required some uh, extra, extra buffer yard requirements. And as we started talking about it, we felt that, that they should be codified across all non-residential uh, single family dwelling. So this ordinance is one that's gone before the, the Planning Commission um, and, and now we're gonna have a, a public hearing on that and it would, it would essentially uh, codify what the buffer yard uh, requirements would be for non single family dwellings in residential areas. I will now call upon Carolyn Brinkley, town clerk, to prevent, present evidence of the published noting of this hear notice of this hearing. Cert, uh, certificate of Publication, State of Maryland, County of Queen Anne's. This is to certify that the annex legal advertisement has been published in the publications and insertions um, listed below the Bay Times Record Observer on 4-16-2021. Thank you. We will first hear from all those in favor of the proposed ordinance 05-2021, and then we'll hear from those opposed. Please keep all comments to three minutes. You are welcome to provide written testimony to the town council as well. I will... Uh, Carolyn, you've already read the, read the notice, so we don't have to do that again. We will now hear from all those in favor of proposed ordinance 05-2021. Please come forward. Let the record show there were none. We will now hear from all, uh, I will say that the, the Planning Commission did provide a letter um, that, that, that uh, voted to forward a favorable recommendation to the Town Council. We will now hear from all those opposing proposed ordinance 05-2021. Please come forward. 
Let the record show there were none. The Centerville Town Council will consider all comments presented this evening before making a final decision regarding proposed ordinance 05-2021. Do I hear a motion to adjourn this hearing? So moved. Second? Second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I now declare this hearing adjourned. All right, next we have uh, appearances. Should we clear uh, swearing in? That's what we're going to do first. We're going to, that's going to be the appearances. So, so one of the things we're going to add on here and, and before A, uh, we've got a number of uh, board and commission appointments that we need to make. And then we've got a few individuals here that are actually going to get sworn in. So uh, I think we were given a, a list of motions if somebody wants to make those either individually or just add them all up. I'll uh, propose a motion. I'll do them all at one time. For OSIF office, for Tim Zuella to the Centerville Planning Commission for a five-year term, to appoint Michael Whitehill to the Centerville Park Advisory Board for a three-year term, to appoint Martha Herman to the Centerville Ethics Commission for a three-year term, to appoint Nancy Weibel to the Centerville Board of Supervisors of Elections for a three-year term. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Is there any further discussion? We have a motion to appoint these four individuals to uh, terms of office. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, so we've got a number of these. In, is everybody here tonight? <clears throat> Yes. All right. So why don't we do it like this? We're going to, I've been speaking enough, so I'm not going to do these oaths. We're going to have, uh, why don't we just do. I've got planning commission in my. Tim. It's all different. Yes. Yes. Okay. Everybody's got one? Yep. All right, why don't we start with Emma? Shelby? Oh. That is going to be Martha Herman. Oh, perfect. All right, if we can have Martha come up and Shelby out front there, and then we'll move on. I've got Nancy. You'll, 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 you'll yep. I'm going to have you sign this when you're done. Yeah, stand right in the center um, there. Yeah. Please la raise your right hand, say I, I, pronounce your name in full, Martha R. Herman, and repeat after me. I, I, do, in your name, Martha R. Herman, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and that I will be faithful, and that I will be faithful, and bear true allegiance, and bear true allegiance, to the state of Maryland, to the state of Maryland, and support the Constitution and laws thereof. And support the Constitution and the laws thereof. And that I will. And that I will. To the best of my skill and judgment. To the best of my skill and judgment. Diligently and faithfully. Diligently and faithfully. Without partiality or prejudice. Without partiality or prejudice. Execute the office of. Execute the office of. Member of the town of Centerville. Member of the town of Centerville. Centerville Ethics Commission. Centerville Ethics Commission. For a three year term. For a three year term. Expiring April 2024. Expiring April 2024. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. According to the Constitution and the laws of this state. The town charter. The town charter. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. Thank you very much. Thank you. Martha, would you, would you tell the audience how long you've been serving uh, various boards and commissions? 29, 29, 29 years. years. Yes, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Much. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy Weibel? Yeah, yeah Nancy Weibel. Thank you, ma'am. How are you today? Got it. Great. <laughs> so please raise your right hand. Say I say I your name. I Nancy Weeble. And repeat after me. I your name. I, I Nancy Weeble. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance. And bear true allegiance. To the state of Maryland. To the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And that I will. And that I will. To the best of my skill and judgment. To the best of my skill and judgment. Diligently and faithfully. Diligently and faithfully. Without partiality or prejudice. Without partiality or prejudice, execute the office of. Execute the office of. Member of the town of Centerville. 
member of the town of Centerville. Centerville Board of Supervisors of Elections. Member of Centerville Town Supervisors. <laughs> <laughs> Centerville Board of Supervisors of Elections. Centerville Board of Supervisors of Elections. Yes. For a three year term. For a three year term. Expiring April 2024. Expiring April 2024. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. The town charter. The town charter. And the laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. And the laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. Thank you. Welcome. Nancy, how long have you been serving? Is it eight months? Perfect. Oh, part of a year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Tim. Tim Zawilla. Good evening. Good evening. Please raise your right hand. Say I and pronounce your name in full and repeat after me. I, Tim Zawilla. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will be faithful. And I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance. And bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland. To the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And that I will. And I will. To the best of my skill and judgment. To the best of my skill and judgment. Diligently and faithfully. Diligently and faithfully. Without partiality or prejudice. Without partiality or prejudice. Execute the office of. Execute the office of. Member of the Centerville Planning Commission. Member of the Centerville Planning Commission. For a five year term. For a five year term. Expiring April 2026. Expiring April 2026. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. The town charter. The town charter. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, how long have you been uh, volunteering? Is it three months? <laughs> 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 Thanks, Tim. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, I, Michael Conrad Whitehill, do solemnly affirm, do swap solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and that I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance and bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland, the state of Maryland, and support the Constitution and laws thereof, and support the Constitution and laws thereof, and that I will, and that I will, to the best of my skill and judgment, to the best of my skill and judgment, diligently and faithfully, diligently and without, faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, without partiality or prejudice, execute the office of, execute the office of, member of the town of Centerville, member of the town of Centerville, Centerville Park Advisory Board, Centerville Parks Advisory Board, for a three-year term, for a three-year term, expiring April 2024, expiring April of 2024, according to the Constitution and laws of this state, according to the Constitution and laws of this state, the town of Centerville, town of Centerville, and the laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville, and the laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. Live long and prosper. <laughs> Mike, how long with all of the things you've done for the town, whether it's on the council or volunteer board? 70. Since 1970. Yeah, right? One way or another. All right. Well, whether it's 50 years or three months, we appreciate all the volunteers. Absolutely. All right. Next, we're going to move into uh, appearance A, Jim Kelbaugh, utility supervisor. Crystal, do you want to? Uh, yes. Um, so I, we wanted to introduce uh, Jim Kelbaugh. He's our uh, new utility supervisor. Um, unfortunately, Kim, uh, Kip was not able to make it to the meeting tonight to um, introduce him to the council and to the citizens. Um, he actually uh, began employment with the town on our water wastewater uh, division uh, side. And um, when the position became available, he did interview um, and we selected him for the position. He was qualified and he has uh, several years of supervisory experience as well as having um, the uh, CDL certified, you know, truck driver, you know, training as well. So he has that training experience. So we're really excited to have him on our streets division team and uh, kind of help with uh, bridging uh, all the departments together and 
working as a team. So we're really excited to have him. Great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming. I appreciate right, it. Thanks. I got to meet you last thank week you. at the nice uh, at the Arbor Day uh, thank event. You. So thanks you're for coming. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, appreciate welcome. it. Welcome. <laughs> we're glad you're here. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Have next, a good night. Next we have uh, Nick Rowden, Short Term Rentals. Good evening. Good evening. I was here a month ago, it's been a month and a half ago, and we started talking about this and I said I would put together a presentation and come back and talk to you guys about it. Uh, we're pretty far into our meeting so far, so I'm going to try and hit the high points on each of these slides and uh, let you guys read the detail on your own at a, at a different time if you'd like. Um, there we go. Um, so a little background and research. Um, you know, there had kind of existed a general consensus working with CETA and with, uh, with the residents that um, the citizens here would benefit from a number of different things that, that they had asked for, and um, additional restaurants and food options, a uh, stronger presence of dis different grocery store options, whether it be uh, natural foods or um, organic or that type of thing, but specialty groceries versus the, the standard chains. Uh, additional stores and shopping and other amenities not currently present. And then one that kept coming up was some type of visitor or tourist accommodations, whether it be hotels or bed and breakfasts or whatever that happens to be. Um, we did a bunch of research. Uh, that research um, pointed out that the town doesn't have the resident population to support a ton of additional restaurants above what we have today, that um, we don't have that population to support the, the widely known specialty grocers. And there are ones that are smaller. Um, but at our current population, we're just not there. Um, that we don't have the tourist base today to support a full service hotel, and that we really face a lot of competition uh, in the B&B market when it comes to places like St. Michael's or Chestertown or those areas. And so it's really hard to have that be the first thing that comes in the door. Um, and that the first stages of building a tourism base here can be accomplished with little or no impact on existing infrastructure capacities. Um, because it's already accounted for. And when we talk about short-term rentals, that's one of the big selling points is that it goes into existing infrastructure and it fits within the parameters of existing infrastructure. So the conclusion that we'll get to at the end here, but uh, that building a tourism base to support of short-term rentals would be beneficial to the existing businesses. It would aid in attracting new business and can be accomplished without undue burden um, to that business or the taxpayers. And so go to the next slide. Sorry, there's a delay, so I won't run. I'll get there. There we go. So the town code regarding short-term rentals, I'm not going to read over the entire thing. The important thing to, to note here, um, that boarding houses, bed and breakfast, and short-term rentals are all included as one group when it comes to the code. Um, and that becomes a problem because they operate significantly different, and it causes undue burden on ones that shouldn't have it. And so when we look at that significant difference between those boarding houses, the bed and breakfast, and short-term rentals, that are, that are all covered under that same special exception that's needed from the um, Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, it's an extremely expensive and time-consuming endeavor to get that exception. It's the same exception I would need if I wanted to put a gas station. Um, and so the fact that you, know, you want to use a house as a short-term rental, that you have to go through a, a process that is that in-depth, really prices you out of the market of ever having one of these. And there was a post on Facebook actually today where somebody said, oh, well, does anybody know if there's any short-term rentals that somebody can use because there are no Airbnbs? There are no Airbnbs here because you have essentially made it impossible to have one. It's just not, it's not economically viable. If somebody's going to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on legal expenses to get through that process, it, there, there's no profit at the end of the day for somebody to put one of those here. Um, so we go to the next slide. It talks about the short-term rentals, and I think you guys are all familiar with these, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on here. But we're talking about the Airbnbs, the VRBOs, HomeAway, and things of that sort. Um, um, so we're actually going to just, because I think you guys all understand the difference, so I'm going to skip over that slide. So the big thing to note about the short-term rentals is they don't change the principal use of the structure. So unlike a 
um, a bed and breakfast where you would have to have individually locking rooms and, and access to bathrooms and things of that sort, or a hotel. We're not changing the principal use of the structure with an Airbnb. It's a single family house. We're using it to, to house the, the representative number of people that would have been there if it had been a single family. Um, we're not changing the number of bedrooms. We're not converting things into bedrooms that aren't meant to be bedrooms. We're really using that property the same way it would be used if there was a family there. The only difference is, is that that family happens to come in and out every week or every other week. Um, you know, and so when it, we looked down through the code and we saw that, you know, the, the kind of things that were outlined there, a lot of them still made sense and still applied, right? When you talk about having the facility inspected and approved by the fire marshal, well, that was done when we issued a, an occupancy permit for the property. But it still doesn't, it's not, um, it's not hard for them to ask to, to do that again, right? You know, I, I talked to the fire marshal and said, hey, you know, is this a big deal? And he went, no, there's a little form you fill out and you come and do that. It's not expensive, it's not hard to do. So there's not a problem with that. Um, comply with the applicable federal, state, and local laws. So we would expect anybody here to be doing those. Um, number three is where we get into trouble, right? The, when we talked about operating under a valid bed and breakfast, boarding house, or short-term rental zoning certificate, that, that comes from planning and zoning, that's where the problem is. And we established that we're not changing the principal use of the structure, and that's where it kind of differs from a bed and breakfast or a hotel. We're not, we're not changing that use. Um, and then just to be clear, this is the operationalized special exception? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, this is a special exemption for the zoning right. um, for you to, to put one in. Um, the off-street parking, um, again, because we're not changing that principal use, we're not changing the number of people who would be allowed in that structure, then we're not, the parking would have been part of that original zoning plan. Um, not involving alteration of the structure in a manner that changes the uh, central residential character of the property or district. Um, still a valid argument and, and no problem with that. And then signs are permitted. Um, to be honest, I, I put in here that said the argument can be made that we wouldn't want to permit signs there. That we wouldn't want any signs there. We, you want to <coughs> stroll down a street and see, you know, house, 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 and one of those three houses is an Airbnb and you don't know which one. That's, that's the whole um, purpose of an Airbnb or a VRB or those is that they fit into the existing uh, structure, or existing area. So I, I talked to a number of people and I thought about <laughs> taking this slide out and then some of them said take it out and some of them said leave it in because there was a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback that oh this is going to be you know, frat parties and, and hippies and vans and that's just not really who uses Airbnb and VRBO. Um, and 25 years ago it might have been, it's not anymore. Uh, really when we look at this town and we look at, at Queen Anne's County in general, the people who want to come visit here are outdoor enthusiasts, there are people who want to go cycling. You know, if you look at Queen Anne's County in general, this is an immensely cycling friendly place. There are hundreds and hundreds of miles of roads with huge shoulders where you don't have to worry about getting hit by a car, unlike DC where you worry on every corner. Um, and so when you talk about the, the people who are coming to visit, that's just not who it's, that, this isn't that area. And the same goes for frat parties and things of that sort. Those groups aren't looking for a quiet town to go party in because they know they're going to end up with the police at their door in a heartbeat. It's just not worth it. Um, you know, the short-term rental market actually encourages people to take care of their houses. When you think about uh, one of the things that Joe said earlier about, you know, we're, we have these dilapidated properties. Well, those companies that allow that, that short-term rental have very <laughs> strict standards you have to follow regarding the appearance of the property. And so it actually, because you want to rent it out for as much as you possibly can, you're encouraged to take better care of your property, or at least as good as all of the neighbors. Um, you know, like I, I said before, the, the mix of the history buffs and the outdoor enthusiasts and that, that is what you're trying to attract here. And that transient population that comes in, it uses your restaurants, it uses those trails that everybody has talked about so far today. Um, and a lot of it is just people trying to get out of town and get some peace and quiet, and that's what we want to bring to town. So I came up with a list of changes that need to be made in order to make this happen. Um, the gist of this is that you have to remove the short-term rentals out of that, that zoning exception part. Um, create a new one just for short-term rentals that kind of goes around a registration basis versus a zoning and planning review because what really we should care about is do we have a button to push if there's a problem? Is there someone that if they complain to the town, do you have an owner that you can say, hey, this is a problem. We have a problem going on here. 
and whether that's um, whether that's Carolyn reaching out, whether it's you know the the police reaching out, it's somebody that you have a contact that you can you can get to. Um, this I am going to go all the way through. So the short-term rental, um, one of the important parts, because a lot of these short-term rental places do allow you to rent out single rooms, uh, and that's why I added in the right to solely occupy a primary, or secondary, or accessory dwelling. Uh, and the reason that I added the secondary or accessory was because if you have a accessory dwelling behind your house right now, you could put it on VRBO and be within zoning. Um, if you tried to rent out your the main house, you would be you would have to go with that exception, um, and that's an important distinction. That right now you could sort of do this and get around the zoning if you had a secondary dwelling on your property, um, but the solely occupy because what I didn't want is to end up with somebody renting out five different house five different rooms in a house. You're essentially getting to a bed and breakfast without the breakfast portion, and it gets really sticky in there, and you create some problems. Let's start small. Let's start small with hey. I want to rent the house out. And if you want to go farther than that at some point, you can do that. Um, but I would encourage you to, to keep it simple to start with. Um, the second one, the bed and breakfast definition, um, I believe that the reason that it had that contains a dwelling unit permanently occupied in the listing was because of ADA. In order to meet ADA standards, that is required. Uh, actually, in order to get an exception from ADA standards, that's required. Um, but the true language of that says by the proprietor. Um, so if we're keeping that in there for the sole purpose of that, we should add the sole by the proprietor section. Um, as I said before, you know, removing short-term rentals from uh, section six of uh, 17019 and 17020, which is the R1 and R2 zoning um, sections, um, those will still apply to boarding houses and bed and breakfast, which are essentially a, a what I'll call a staffed business. There's somebody there who's running it and treating short-term rentals at, for what they are. Um, you're creating a, a new section that essentially has those same pretty much development standards with the exception of the zoning exception. So you have it inspected and approved by the fire marshal. You comply with the applicable federal, state, and local laws. Uh, I added in here as well as the covenants of any HOA or any other thing. If you have an HOA that says, hey, we don't allow these here, well, they still have to abide by that. This doesn't get them around that. And there are certainly ones here that would. You know, I, I, My guess is Symphony Village has something in their HOA that says you can't do this here. And that's okay. Um, but for the places that don't or don't have an HOA or don't have that restriction, um, that's where these would be allowed. <sighs> Register with the town. Carolyn, I'm sure is angry at me putting this in here, but if somebody somebody does have to keep that list, right? And it has to, you know, it would be the town keeping a list of registered properties and say, look, this is our registration list. These are our homeowners. This is our point of contact, and making it available to to the police in the instance where you have something that they have to respond to. They know who to call. Um, I don't think it has to be incredibly in depth, but I think it just has to be a requirement of asking for that. Um, you know, I'm sure there would be some charge for it, but it doesn't come close to the charge of having to go before the zoning board and bring an attorney in in order to get an exception to put this here. Um, you know, the provided for the off-street parking, I believe that the buffer is actually removed by one of the, um, by the one you read earlier, because it had an exception in the last paragraph of the, the zoning ordinance that you read earlier. Um, so if it's, uh, my house doesn't have any off-street parking. Yep. So what does that mean in terms of my ability or anybody's ability to do this if I don't have any off-street parking? So I believe that depending on where your house is, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been required to have off-street parking, right? Okay. And so that same thing would apply. I mean, there's plenty of places that have them. You, you're, you're essentially living within whatever zoning um, would exist for your house, whether you were occupying it or whether you were doing a short-term right. rental to okay. somebody else. Um, you know, I don't think you're... You're not stepping outside of the zoning that's already there, and that's the big thing: is that this is meant to be a property of this size with this many occupants, this many bedrooms, etc. Um, you're not. If you were approved for the zoning when it was built, then your grandfather didn't under that, anyways. I would think. Um, so, not involve any alteration interior or exterior of the structure. Uh, in a manner that changes the essential residential character of the property of the district. And that's important to make sure that people don't turn their dining rooms and every other room in that house into a bedroom. Um, and you know, the, the whole point of that is, again, 
that property is zoned for a certain number of people, the, the water and sewer are allocated for a certain number of people inside that dwelling, and we don't want a house where you know it's a three bedroom house turned into a six bedroom house by turning everything that isn't the living room into a bedroom. Um, and then again, you know, I, I mentioned about the signs. I, I would strongly encourage you to put a note in there that says, look, we're not gonna allow signs that say, hey, this is an Airbnb, that's not what we want. What you want is it to be a, a silent thing, and I'll tell you that um, I, I've seen a number of these, and very, very rarely have I ever seen one actually identified as an Airbnb. That's just not how, how they're done, so. Bottom line, building our tourism base through Building our tourism base through support of short-term rentals, beneficial to the existing businesses, aid in attracting new business, uh, accomplished without undue burden, especially when it comes to wastewater and sewer, or uh, water and sewer. Um, you know, the nature of short-term rentals, Airbnb, VRBO, is that they fit into that existing residential area. Um, they don't change the principal use of the structure and they don't adversely affect the surrounding properties. Um, and that the existing codes make it almost impossible and definitely not practical or profitable for a short-term rental to exist today. And that you all should strongly consider amending that code to make it possible. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions or comments? No questions. This is a wonderful presentation, though. So I, I do have a couple of comments. Um, I agree that, that the process is broken, that there's, that there's a disincentive. Primarily the way that I see it is because of the cost associated with getting a special exception. But I will say that this is a business. So when you have a short-term rental, you're essentially not living there. You're, you're changing the usage. Even though maybe a family that's coming, you're still changing it from a traditional residential dwelling unit who's there all the time to a short-term, one week, whatever. I mean, I've rented these all over the place. I'd love them, right? They're awesome. But, but the inherent change is absolutely there. This ordinance, putting these things in, came about because of this exact issue. We had one who people were coming for a wedding. People came and they stayed in town for the rehearsal dinner. There was four different couples. They got five different cars. They were out there being loud. The town had no hammer, right? We, we essentially were not able to do anything. There was, you know, it was right, you talk about not having off street parking. This was a pro property that had no off street parking. And now you've got six cars or five cars out in front and you're kind of disrupting the whole thing. So I, I think that when you're, when you're making a business, you need to figure out, you got to put it in a driveway if you're going to do it at your house because you're essentially putting a business in. Um, I absolutely feel that the town needs to have a hammer. Calling the police is not, a, is not just, they're being loud because people can be loud, right? I mean, you're allowed to, you're allowed to be loud. Um, if, if you go through a process and your, your, your permit gets pulled, you're done, right? The town getting in touch with Airbnb, that, that's just, you know, that's not going to, that, that's just not going to happen. Um, the other part about using, utilizing an accessory structure, that wouldn't work because they probably aren't going to have water and sewer and you can't actually have a dwelling unit where there's not water and sewer. And so, you know, that's, that's a whole other, other part. I, I do think there's probably a way to get from here to there. Um, I, I would encourage the Economic Development Ad Hoc Committee to kind of come up, but I, I have to say, like, it's, it's definitely a change. In my opinion, it's, it's a change in use and, and we need to have that special exception procedure to ensure that uh, the change in use is going to be okay. I, I get the money is, is cost prohibitive. I, I totally understand that. Um, so I, I just think that it, that there needs to be more, more of a look, uh, more look at this. And the, other, and the other part is that boarding houses and bed and breakfasts typically they're owner occupied. And so when the owner is physically there, there's a lot less of a chance of shenanigans going on. When the owner We've heard it tonight, right? When the owner lives out of town or out of state or whatever, and this is an investment property, there could be. I, I, I've stayed at VRBOs. I know that they're typically uh, in very, very good shape. The majority of the ones that I've stayed in, where it's the whole community is, is a VRBO, and, and essentially it's not a residential neighborhood anymore. Um, so I, I, I think that not having it owner-occupied, uh, we just need to have a little bit of, a, of an extra level of, of scrutiny. So in my opinion, the, the real issue is cost associated with doing it. So I don't know if there's a way we can change that, but maybe. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I fully appreciate those comments. And I think that, you know, when I talked about having a, a registration, I think that was the same thing. That's the thing, that's your hammer, right? That's the look, we'll pull this and you're good, you're done. <laughs> um, and so I totally agree with you. There has to be, you guys have to have some authority to say, look, shape up or, or we're done with this. Um, right, but, but if, it's, if it's by right, there's no permit that's needed. I mean, if it's a by right thing in a zoning district, there's no permit that's needed. Well, no, I think the, the proposal here was to add a, right now, section six talks about the special exemption. Um, section seven, which would be a new section, would talk about a special exemption that was essentially needed. It's not by right. It's a granted registration, and you reserve the right to revoke that registration if they don't, they don't act. I don't know if we have a special, I don't know if special exemption is a thing. Like, I'm not sure if that's a legal thing that you can have. Maybe. We'll look into it. Yeah. I appreciate your presentation. I'll just say quickly, you know, I, I think it's imperative for the town to catch up to the 21st century. You know, this is where people are going when they visit places. Uh, as the council president just said, he's using them in other places. I have stayed in one in East Nashville that was in a very residential neighborhood. And, you know, as you said, Nick, you can't tell, right, unless you've stayed there or owned the property. In that instance, you couldn't tell that it was, you know, an Airbnb or rental property. So uh, I want to see how we can make this work. Because I think it is, as you said, you know, one of the things that's missing from town clearly is a place to spend the night. And I think we are fighting an uphill battle with trying to get people to come to town without that. And I don't think, you know, frankly, I don't want the Holiday Inn or the, the Hampton Inn to come to town. I'd rather be a boutique style hotel. This feels like a step in that direction. And I just don't know, you know if you can go to Chestertown and have an Airbnb, you can go to Easton St. Michael's. But not Centerville, which is another thing Centerville doesn't have, a place to stay. So I think we ought to try to make it work. Uh, again, I think the HOAs, Northbrook, you're probably not going to do this. Symphony Village, probably not going to do it. But in the historic part of town, I think people are going to pay a premium to come down there. And I think they're going to take care of those properties while they're there. And I think it could be a real boon to the town. So I that's where I am on it. One of the things right. to note is that there's no, there's none here right now. And so for people interested in investing and stuff like this, there's a huge market here. Um, there's a huge untapped market, but it has to, as you said, it has to be easy enough that they can come in and, and do it. And right now it's not, it's just not, they'd never get around to a profit. But I mean, I, I just don't know if we've had any, I, I agree. I, I'd love to have these things here. I'd like to figure out this, this problem, right? I don't even know if we've ever had anyone call maybe, I mean, and say, Hey, I want to do a bed and breakfast. Or, I mean, I want to do a short-term rental. Am I allowed to do it? Maybe there's some that are operating already illegally, right? I don't know. Yeah. We'll uh, find out pretty quick, probably. I have one <laughs> thought. Uh, we mentioned all the towns surrounding towns and on the Eastern Shore have Airbnbs and VRBOs and all that. I would hope we don't reinvent or an ordinance. I would hope we would look at the ordinances that are already on the books in similar towns. It's the same thing for how we would improve our tourism and economic development using the historic nature of the town. So uh, I would hope that we, the council, would ask our town manager and, and whoever would be appropriate that uh, uh, look into other towns and see what they've had. I didn't hear that. I assume you researched it, but uh, there has to be other ordinances in other towns of our size that we could uh, use as a basis. Is that I'm fairly certain that we're, when we got this, we, we stole it from someone okay, else. Okay, I so. understand. But that now is now. And it's like Steve says, we need to bring it into the 21st century. Yeah, I'd, I'd and, love to see what see what Chestertown and St. Michael's and uh, Easton, yeah. if they have regulations. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The goal is to ease yourself into this, right? I mean, I would love to see a bed and breakfast downtown here, but that's not going to happen until you have a tourism base to support it. And that's not going to happen until we start to bring that tourism base. So you got to start somewhere. And, and I agree. I think you can probably find, I know you can run the gamut in places that don't regulate it at all and places that crank down on it to an extreme amount there's probably a happy medium in there that you can get to. Thank you, Next. Yeah. Yeah, thank Nick. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. All right. Next, we're going to go uh, Andre Damati. Damati, I apologize if I said that incorrectly. Talking Communications. Welcome. Thanks for being patient, guys. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Andre. I'm Andrew, by the way. Yeah, it's coming. There. 
And we have it up here, just so you know. Set up here, please. <laughs> Well, I'm Andrew. I'm Andrew. I'm Andrew. I'm Andrew. I'm Andrew. Yeah, we uh, are owners of Talk to Creation. Um, this is one of us we've met in two months. Um, we are a fiber internet company. We're bought. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are the ones that uh, started the fiber construction in Northbrook. We are almost completed in Northbrook, and we are working in other areas of Centerville. Uh, we're doing Willow Branch right now, and our intentions are going throughout the entire town of Centerville. Um, but it's going to take a little bit of time. So just a little bit about us, if I can get this to work. Um, Andrew and I are both uh, ex-Verizon guys. We've been at, uh, we started Verizon in 2000 working in the internet department. Um, we've started uh, Talkie in 2012 and we started doing fiber optics in 2018. And um, we, this slide's a little bit old, but we have about, what, about a thousand miles, thousand miles, about five, a thousand miles, including uh, uh, last mile fiber throughout uh, Chestertown, um, Kent County, Centerville, Green Ants County. Green Ants County, and we are starting Whisker County in, uh, in a, next month. Um, this is just some of our employees, our uh, head construction guy. We have our own internal construction company. Um, we use uh, our own team, and we also have subcontractors, depending on where territory we're at and what, uh, what the needs are. Um, our entire installer base is all X Verizon. We uh, try to get X Verizon guys because we know they're really well trained. And um, I mean, you can talk to anyone in Northbrook now since we're lit there to see how uh, our service is. Okay. So, Talkie Communications is a CLEC. We uh, CLEC in multiple states. Uh, we do not have any contracts. We are literally a month-to-month -month uh, fiber company, so if you're not happy with our service, you can leave. Um, we do not offer teaser rates. We do not offer contracts. We don't automatically increase customers' rates arbitrarily. Uh, actually, we do our best never to raise the rates, but um, so far we haven't had any rate increases. Uh, we are A-plus at the Better Business Bureau, um, and we offer internet speeds up to 10 gigabit. Uh, which is 10 times faster than what the normal customer gets is, is one gigabit is the fastest speed what most residential customers get. Um, uh, our headquarters is in Chestertown. We're in uh, 99 Talbot Boulevard. Um, so we're local. I live in Chestertown. Andrew lives here in Centerville. Okay. Uh, we offer fiber optic internet. Um, our TV service is coming soon. It's over-the-top TV. We offer digital voice and home security systems. So we do offer the triple play um, starting in August, hopefully. Um, and we just got a letter of recommendations from Ca uh, Queen Anne's County, uh, which I'm sure you've seen that. Um, and this is just a, an article showing that uh, we offer 10 gigabit services with our partner of Adtran. Adtran's our provider of our, of our fiber optic equipment. Um, and this is just some of the pictures of our internal construction team. And uh, this was last year when we had our one year anniversary with our construction team. And our organization chart. Um, the reason why we're here today is we wanted to introduce ourselves because we are doing business in Centerville and we wanted to finally meet everyone face to face. Um, we are, like I said, we're almost completed with uh, Northbrook and um, once that is completed we are going to be working throughout the town towards Sympathy Village and then trying to cover as much of the town as possible. Meanwhile we're also doing areas like Willow Branch, Kingstown, uh, Route 544, and other areas throughout the town. Um, but we wanted to talk about, uh, I saw a post on Facebook, I think from Tim, that uh, the ARPA money that uh, the town is getting, that you guys are looking to invest in broadband. 
and we wanted to talk about it, see if you guys were interested in a public-private partnership. Um, I'll let Andrew take over here about how the fiber infrastructure is, um, how it works. And so we'll give a little basics of cost of fiber optics. Um, it is actually very expensive to deploy and it's very expensive to maintain. I'll give you an example. Northbrook cost almost a million dollars to deploy. And that obviously using contractors and we had to be extremely careful because the, the, the so septic water and other utilities. Um, going through the problems that we face delivering fiber optics to Centerville is everything downtown is cement. There's nothing to drill and it's very dangerous to drill. So we are specializes in dr we're drilling in um, the areas that we do, mostly rural areas. So an example of like the post that we saw on Facebook uh, about the, the money that was invested, it's going to cost to do make readies. And what a make ready is, you call Verizon and Delmarva and say, I want to get onto your telephone poles. What would the cost be? Just one street in um, the Chester Town was $45,000 to say, this is a make ready. And then what they have to do is, if the telephone pole is old, they have to replace the telephone pole. Whoever is the last person that wants to get on it has to pay. Just make sure that's very clear. So the power movement, any of that uh, cables, if there's old cables on there, Verizon was charging us to, to replace their cables. Um, so we are doing a survey right now that in Centerville. We're doing every single telephone pole, both sides of the street going all the way through um, the older section and the new section next to uh, Little Kid Well and across the railroad tracks. Uh, from what our experience is, it's going to be upwards of $400,000 to get the make readies to be prepared in the town. And that doesn't, that's not fiber deployment, that's just use of the telephone poles. And it's going to take over six months to actually get onto those telephone poles once it's approved. So example is if you get the telephone poles and you see the, the metal that people used to climb back in the 60s, those poles will have to be replaced. Uh, traffic control um, will have to be implemented, which is very expensive. So these are some of the expenses that we saw in Chestertown. That being said, um, Andre and I both have plans to do all of uh, Centerville, but it's going to take a very long time due to the extreme cost. and. Um, so we do partner with Maryland Broadband, if you're familiar with who they are. Maryland Broadband is a nonprofit organization that is throughout all of Maryland, and we use them today as our backbone, so does a lot of other ISPs. So we went to them and said, hey, we know you have fiber next to the courthouse. Can we bar rent uh, 12 fibers and so we can splice it up to be distribution fiber? Well, nobody wants a backbone fiber being chopped up, and I, I, I knew it was a long shot. Yeah, well, once you chop the fiber up, everything from this side and everything from that side is dead. Yes. It's, so It's useless. So if it's coming from Ashburn, Virginia, you've just destroyed four or five hundred miles of fiber because you want to use it for distribution. So unfortunately, we were turned down, um, and this is, we use them as backbone. If we wanted to get to the other side, like Symphony Village, they would rent us the fiber to get to there, but that is what's called backbone fiber. So I'll just give a little, not to bore you, there's two styles of fiber. There's called F1 and F2. F1 is backbone fiber. Backbone fiber is something we would run from um, Chestertown to Centerville. And that's design is to get to a splitter. And you can think of that as long haul fiber. Long haul fiber. And that's what the nonprofit organization today does. It's long haul fiber. And we use them. We use them a lot of, in a lot of places. So the next one is F2. What's F2? That's distribution fiber. So in order to get to all the residents, let's just say in the, in the town, we would need to put splitters up. And each splitter is a 32-way split. Well, you, there's not that much houses in, in the downtown section. So you would have to put multiple splitters across the path in order to get each house. So one fiber comes in, 32 fibers come out, every single person has their own fiber. So this is uh, a very costly endeavor uh, to, in order to actually go through the town because it's, it's all telephone pole, 
And unfortunately, you have to use both Verizon and Delmarva because if you do um, Delmarva's poles, you get to one side of the street. But if you want to go to the other side, you have to use the Verizon poles in order to hop on. So the make readies are literally every single pole in the whole entire town, which right now I think we're up to 200 poles surveyed. Uh, it's been taking us about a month and a half to survey. We're, we're only one side of the strip down. Um, an example of a survey, uh, two people go out, you might have already seen our guys, go out with a measuring tape, or measuring measure stick, rod. rod, and they have to measure every single wire, take pictures of the pole, record all the data, um, and overlay the map. We only get about five poles a day because of the extreme amount yeah. of work. It, you would think when you're putting new fiber up, you could just go on the bottom. That's logical. This is not a logical system. Uh, the last provider has to go in the middle and everyone gets pushed down. So Verizon's always on the bottom, then it's always Atlantic Broadband, and then the next provider. So for us to get on any telephone pole, everybody in the middle down would have to be moved. Every single person. So, so we have to pay make readies for Verizon, Atlantic Broadband, Del Marvel Power. Everyone has to be, all three companies have to be paid, we have to pay. So the alternative is to drill, which it's not going to happen, it's not gonna happen in right. the town because it's too dangerous. Nobody wants to afford to pay for a damaged pipe. Um, there's too much cement. There's no place to put the handholds. And when you do do a handhold, how do you get to the other side of the street? You got to do a, a road shot. And nobody wants to do a road shot, especially with all the money was spent under the roads. So, so why, why can't you go under the sidewalks? Go under the side, so we can go under the sidewalks, but we would have pop up in somewhere. order. So I'll give you an example. Um, next to the ice cream shop in town, you see a vault in the street. We would literally have to chop up the uh, the sidewalk, put a, a, a vault, a in concrete there. vault in, and then if we want to get to the other side, we'd have to then get a twenty foot drill, and we'd have to drill sideways which I don't think there's even room for a drill to fit. And if it would, it would be in somebody's yard in order to shoot under and the, if, the road. And if there's pipes, sewage, water in the road, have you'd to, have to block the road off, saw up the road, remove everything, dig down, look at the road, look at the pipes, find the depth. It's, it's a requirement by law. You have to do that. And then you have to place it, put the uh, tar back on, it, it's very costly. You didn't have to do that at the Northbrook, though. When you we were be, supposed we, to. We had, that's what took us so long to get the permit, because we were insisting to do it, and they were insisting we didn't do it. Um, it by misutility, the, to. the law, you, you need to, but we came to an agreement is if we're under seven foot, we're, we're, no one's going to hit anything. Um, so what would prevent you from doing that? Well, here. The, the, I mean, I'm just trying to say, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. if it's no, super costly to go up the poles, and you were able to utilize it, the towns right away underneath a, underneath a sidewalk? Yes. So what would happen is it, you'd have to have, in order to get the depths of seven foot, um, I'm, what's the deepest? Does anybody know the deepest pipes in the town, in the roads that we just I don't know. We've got some that are deeper than that. Okay. Some deeper than that. In order to get a, um, a seven foot run, uh, I don't know the exact um, footage, but you have to be really, really far. So I'll give you an example in Northbrook. When we first go through the Northbrook community, in order to get to the other side, we had to be about 200 feet behind. And in order to do the pipe, so it drills down at an angle, goes down, 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 then it goes back up. We were not able to actually do that depth in the Northbrook and put the vaults where we wanted to. So what we told our construction crew, because we had to figure a solution, just overshoot the vault and then put a conduit and then shoot go backwards so basically the pipe goes this way and then back in order to put the vault where we wanted to do it there's really no room to do le road shots left to right now we can go lateral uh, in a lot of spots but some of the spots like if you drive into the out of town if you look next to the well, i guess right here um this little corner over here if i get the right next to the gas station um, and the courthouse. You can drill all the way up to the courthouse, but then it's all cement from here past the traffic. I mean, honestly, I don't think anyone in their right mind would bury fiber in town. It's, it's very too dangerous. Very I don't think risky. any contractor would do it. But that's the reason why the aerial is the, really the only safe solution. Can it be drilled? Yes, it can be drilled. 
we had to do a lot of uh, damage um, to sidewalks and having to repair and replace, it might actually be cost three times more expensive to go under than it uh, goes aerial. So that being said, we wanted to let you guys know that we, we do intend to get everywhere of eventually. We have a couple larger projects coming up. But we were looking, if we can do a partnership with you, and if you guys would, um, would want to be interested in doing, helping us get through the middle of the town to the aerial, we'll commit to doing the rest of the town uh, within two years, with about a 99% uh, coverage. And what do you estimate the cost is to go through town? Going through town, the make readies alone is going to be about four hundred thousand dollars, is what we're estimating right now. We won't know the final price until after Verizon and Delmarva returns back um, the bid. I think it's going to be somewhere around uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars just to submit the request. How they do it is by per poll. So what you do is after you get all the data, and we're doing this in house, so it would, it would be way, uh, it's like $150 a poll to survey if we hired uh, an, uh, a third party to do it. Uh, we would submit those requests to Verizon with the fee document. Verizon, everybody on the telephone poll will have to come out and do a survey and then everybody gives us a, 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 a price tag. So if Atlantic Broadband's on there, they're going to charge us. If Delmarva's on there, do it's on there. Everybody will send us a bill saying, in order for us to do your move, this is the cost. So um, the cost was so expensive on one street in Chestertown that at this time we decided not to do it. Yeah, we've we, uh, been in Chestertown. We have the entire incorporated limits of Chestertown completed, except for historic downtown. It would be due to the cost. Due to the cost. So, so if you're saying this partnership, right, you're looking for the town to go to do what I, from where and to where? Like, could you have um, parties to um, right, cross the, right past the gas station? Um, what is it, Sitco? So bridge to bridge, essentially. Yes. Down two streets or just one? It would be down. Both sides. So it's got to go. And that's the only gotta... way to service 100 per, or 99% of the people. They'd have to be on both sides, all the telephone poles. Um, we necessarily would not use both sides of the telephone poles. The original plan is to use Delmarva's poles for the F1 and use the Verizon poles when necessary to get to the customer that subscribes, which is called a drop, F2. So you, so you would need the town to do F1 and F2 down both well, sides? Well, we, we were really looking for the, the help on the make readies, not the F2. No, we, we would that do, would be no, that's preparing, that's preparing the poles. Yeah, preparing the poles so we could do the job because the cost of preparing just to deploy the fiber it's so expensive. Yeah, we, we would pay for all, all the fiber infrastructure, all the splitters, all the fiber, all the distribution, all the CPE for everything. The only thing we're looking for is if you guys want to invest uh, with the ARPA funds for broadband, that would be to prepare the telephone poles. So if that was the case, would you allow other uh, providers to rent from you? Yes. Yeah, we do, we do lease dark fiber now, Okay. if anyone was interested. All right. So if somebody said, "I don't want, I don't want to go with you guys. I want to go with uh, Company B." If Company B wants to rent the fiber, absolutely. Okay. Are there standard rates on that? I mean, yes, it's about seventy-five dollars a mile. So Maryland Broadband is seventy-five dollars a mile. Do it is one hundred fifty dollars a mile. But realistically, for F one, this is the whole point that we have. F one is already going through the town, which is the back. Yeah, Maryland line. Broadband already goes through the town. So if we wanted. If what we need to get to the other side anyway, but if we wanted to get to the other side, we could easily skip the town. Even this very, it's very bad to skip the town because the return on investment in town. Yeah. This is where everybody's we, at. We don't want to skip the town. We're just saying is there's already a nonprofit F1 provider in town, which goes past it. But unfortunately, other than going through town, if, if it was a more rural area, we could set cabinets. For instance, um, Northbrook, we're using Maryland Broadband to get to White Marsh. And from White Marsh, we're doing all the distribution. So that's where Maryland Broadband, which is a great partner to us, helps us. But unfortunately, if we had to use Maryland Broadband to get to the town, like say for in the middle of the town, we have no means of distribution because we still need to get on those telephone poles for distribution. So that's the problem that we run into is, it's the F1 is not the problem, it's actually using what's on the F1, because Maryland Broadband already has F1. And typically, 
a company like Maryland Broadband has either 78 fibers or 48 fibers going through town. The way it works is you have your backbone fiber, you need two fibers. You, you send it to a cabinet, our cabinet's on White Marsh. That cabinet would then bring uh, 144 fibers throughout town to the town, and that 144 would be distribution. So you would split it, one to 32, and then 32 customers will all get their own fiber. So Maryland Broadband, obvious, for obvious reasons, we knew they were gonna say no. Yes. Uh, to ask them to use their backbone fiber as distribution, it would destroy their entire yeah. path. If, if we use their backbone for distribution, everything from the place that we cut into all the way to past the Bay Bridge would be destroyed. So if the town can't invest, what is your time frame, your realistic time frame on, you know, it's unknown. let's say... Yeah, it's unknown at this point. Okay. If, if uh, Verizon comes back with $500,000, which we're thinking they're gonna come back, you're, if this goes forward, we'd have to replace telephone poles. So does that mean that you would go to the, let's say, Symphony Village first, and then well, the exterior most, parts? Most likely, we would have to go around down, town. around town through the back way, um, Spanier Spanier Neck. Neck to the back town, all the way to the Route eight, um, 18, is it? Yeah, we'd have to go around town. We'd have to go around town. Because... Yeah, we can't get to Sympathy Village unless we go through town or around town. Got it. So it's either going to go in 305, Go up 301, come back, which is insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, I'm I, I'm for this, right? I, I'm the one that brought up that I think we should invest five hundred thousand dollars, and yeah. the money's not there. So yeah. Castle has said it's got to be a private investment, and so you know, I, I'd love to figure out a way to get this stuff in, especially in the downtown area, all over town, right? I, I just don't <coughs> know how we're going to do it. And that's the same thing we're proposing to Chester Town. Is <laughs> downtown is going to be left behind. Um, there, there's a lot of broadband down there now. There's no cell phone service down in Chestertown downtown. Um, it just it's going to be left behind. When you're paying forty forty five thousand dollars for sixteen homes just for the make readies, that's not including the fiber, the hub, the distribution, the CPE, the drop. You never make the money off of sixty dollars a month off of sixteen customers to pay for that. Never. It's never going to happen. Right. So. Okay. Anybody have any comments? All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we're going to move into consent agenda, items one through item two. We've got two items on the consent agenda, and uh, I think we've got a sample motion here if uh, we're okay to do it on the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve consent agenda items one and two. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion on the floor to uh, con approve the consent agenda. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. It works. Yay, our first one. <laughs> All right. That's it for the consent agenda. Next, we've got old business 2021 fireworks. Unless there's any fireworks, don't, uh, you know, let, let's move it along any updates uh, just really quick we um we've been working on a lot of stuff we're coming up with some ideas we've contacted food vendors we're getting them in and um we have a petting zoo, petting zoo that's um planned and um i don't remember excellent thank you. Yep. thank you thank you <laughs> all right next moving into ordinance new business ordinance 06 2021 FY22 budget. Uh, I will read, unless some, somebody else wants to do it, I'll just read the top of that there. Uh, 05, 20, uh, yeah. Text Amendment buffer yard requirements for non single family dwellings. No, no, no. No, no, sorry. no. I'm sorry. That 06, was, 06 that was under the consent Ordinance for agenda, the purpose so. of adopting a budget for the okay. town of there Senate Bill for fiscal year 2022. There we go. Well, submit the rest for uh, the record. Next, we're going to move on to trash recycle yard waste bid consideration. Uh, yeah, we're, we're just asking if uh, we can table this uh, topic until the next meeting just to tie up some loose ends. Okay. Uh, and we're also asking for the same for the quarterly landfill fees to table as it pertains to the trash and recycling. Okay. Can we also make a motion on the yard waste? On the yard waste. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Except for that. Okay. <laughs> so we're, 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 we're not going to do the... All of B and all of C, but we're going to do yard waste. Uh, I make a motion to approve Downs Lawn Service for a five-year contract 
in the amount of $279,208.62 for July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2026 with two one-year options for renewal per the prices quoted for subsequent years. Second. Right, we have a motion and a second. I just have to say Downs has done a fantastic job. Yeah, they really no question. Unbelievable, right? We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Uh, all right, next, utility bill late fees slash shutoffs. Okay, so um, I just did a small memo letting you know when the state of emergency was proclaimed in March of 2020, the governor signed his executive order, which prohibit prohibited terminating any services, charging late fees. Um, effective September 2020, his, his order expired and was not renewed. So based on the above information, I'm recommending we go back to our late policy with the fees and shutoffs effective the June 2021 billing, billing cycle. Okay. Do you have any motions or any questions or uh, comments? I'll accept the motion to approve. So moved. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion to approve staff's recommendation. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, Ordinance 07 2021, zoning text amendment, Carter Farm. Yeah, uh, Steve, uh, do you want to read that? I do, as soon as I get my act together here. I'm, uh, I'm going to be the principal sponsor of this, and this is just to get the process started on Carter Farm for the Planning Commission. So an ordinance of the Town Council of Centerville to amend the town's zoning ordinance codified as Chapter 170 of the Town Code to establish regulations for the des designation of an agriculture neighborhood district as a floating zone in order to administer and enforce <coughs> the town's zoning ordinance more effectively. All right, we'll submit the rest for the record. We're going to put that before the Planning Commission. Is that, uh, they have time to look at it this, this meeting? I this? believe it's on their um, agenda for next week. All right. Did we, uh, did we pass 5-2021? Yes. Did that I, was part of, I, that was the consent agenda. That was the consent agenda. Oh, we did that. Perfect. See <laughs> Love that consent agenda. Yeah. They couldn't get out of it. <laughs> Uh, next, we're going to go through the 2020 year-end accomplishments. Um, if, you know, we're, we're tight on we're time gonna, here. Yeah, we were going to recommend that, I mean, because we have it posted on the website under with the agenda and everyone has a copy, um, that we just kind of move That's forward. Great job. That. Thank you. Uh, next is correspondence. Uh, as I said, we did receive a letter from the Planning Commission approving uh, their approval of, of uh, a recommendation of Ford, a little recommendation for 05-2021. I don't have any other correspondence. Uh, next, we're gonna go reports of boards and commissions, Centerville Park Advisory Board. All right, so I have, um, we had a meeting on Tuesday, and as you can see, everyone came out in droves today to make their support known for the uh, perimeter trail. That uh, was a big part of our conversation. Um, I have a letter that I think you guys all have a copy of that I just would like to read um, from Mike Lato. So it says, at its, regular meet at its regular meeting on May 4th, 2021, the Centerville Parks Advisory Board unanimously voted to recommend that any plan approved on the lands of Chesterfield LLC, known locally as the Carter Farm, provide the eight foot uh, wide perimeter trail along its entire tidal frontage on out as outlined on the adopted Centerville Parks Master Plan. As in the past, this recommendation may be most appropriately implemented as a condition of the granting of growth allocation, an entirely discretionary act whose authority rests solely with the town council. The park's master plan was developed to provide a unifying public and ADA compliant link along the Corsica River tributaries, which the advisory board regards as the town's most valuable and marketable resource. An additional founding proposes the purpose of the plan was to join together the many different neighborhoods along its path with a common recreational element, open to all with the goal of strengthening our town's community, unity, while defining and broadening our sense of place. We are bringing our people together. A guiding principle of the critical areas 
in 1984 was to expand and preserve public enjoyment of the waters of the state. Centerville is unique among all Maryland municipalities in that our adoption of that principle, as exemplified by our trail system, is unmatched given our new, nearly two and a half miles of buffered tributary tidal shoreline. A missed opportunity now is a loss forever. The Parks Advisory Board stands ready to assist any developer in sitting the perimeter trail positioning overlooks, consulting on design materials, backing CAC waivers if needed, and in any other way deemed helpful. This trail features and the intimacy it provides with our nature re natural resources is important to the Parks Advisory Board as we cannot just look to tomorrow when our change is stewardship of, of more distant future. We thank, with thanks for your consideration of our recommendation, Michael C. Whitehill, Chair of, on behalf of the Centerville Parks Advisory Board. Thank you. Anything else on Parks Advisory Board? That'd be it. All right. Council of Governments? Uh, no mean we have one next Wednesday. Nice. We're looking forward to your report. Yep. Maryland Municipal League? Nothing to report. Better next time. Uh, planning Commission. I have a couple of updates. Um, at the last Planning Commission meeting, the Planning Commission approved the final site plan for the YMCA. Uh, they're going to go through some final things that they got to get done, but hopefully they're planning on starting to dig sometime soon. So that's a long time coming. Uh, they also approved a final site plan and a subdivision for GTI, which is going to have a grow operation down in the business park. Uh, last night we had a meeting to talk further about the comp plan, and they're going to come back to the council with recommendations on we need to modify or uh, update our allocations policy because we're running... The allocations are getting lower. That's everything I have for the Planning Commission. Economic Development Ad Hoc Committee? I don't have anything. All right. Reporter Department Heads, Town Manager. Before I go to Crystal, as the uh, Acting Town Manager, Steve is on vacation this week, uh, this, uh, part, you know, right now. He, um, I did just want to mention, and this is authorized by him, that after uh, 44 years of county and town government, uh, Steve will actually be retiring on January 5th, 2022. Uh, we are going to advertise this position and more to come with that. But, you know, 44 years, uh, that's a pretty long time. So uh, he's, been a, he's been a great asset. And I'll turn it over to you, Crystal. Uh, well, I actually don't have any updates at the moment uh, for the town manager position. Um, All right. Yeah, that's it. Do we have any questions? <laughs> no? Hearing none, we're going to move to the chief of police. Good evening. As research proposed and presented to Council, it's my intent to ask each of you to support and vote to approve the request for the Law Enforcement Officers Pension System, also known as LEOPS, for the sworn law enforcement officers of the Centerville Police Department. This pension system is specific to the law enforcement officer and will help to retain our current sworn staff and recruit the best, most highly qualified police officers throughout the state and for future generations of those police officers who will stand to serve at the residence for the town of Centerville. I would like to make a motion that we include enrollment in the law enforcement officer pension system effective immediately for the FY22 fiscal year. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to uh, be uh, adopt LEOPS. Is there any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, hearing none. Thank That's you all very much. Thank That's you. That's all I have for this meeting. All right. Thank you. Town Attorney? I have nothing to report this evening. All right, thank I have you. Nothing from Ms. Van Emberg either. Okay. Uh, Public Works not here tonight. Human Resources Manager? Well, I'll be working with the Chief of Police <laughs> in getting everybody enrolled. Um, but uh, Right now, we, you know, I've already introduced the new utility supervisor. Um, as I said, he'll be supervising the streets division, um, and uh, kind of creating a bridge, with, you know, between the water wastewater department with uh, Connolly as the other supervisor for the water wastewater division. Um, again, you know, unfortunately, uh, Kip was not able to come this evening, um, but. Uh, hopefully, if there's any updates, we'll make sure that you get that information as soon as possible. Thank you. All right, uh, finance officer not here, town clerk. Just really quick, I wanted to follow up on um, Steve's request for the CRC to come attend a meeting. They are scheduled to come to the June 3rd meeting to present the report. Excellent. Thank you. All right, citizens forum number two. Any citizens that would like to come up, come on up. Mm -hmm. 
What? What was that? Hi, my name is Elaine Studley. I live at 201 South Liberty and I'm here to talk about fiber. <laughs> Um, I have been following the fiber project since before I moved here. I had to shut down a business because we did not have adequate fiber to support the business that I did, and it recently impacted my daughter in one of her college programs. Uh, Montgomery County, where we came from um, a decade ago, has actually had fiber for 20 years, and it has, beyond the shadow of a doubt, has influenced their economic development. We don't want to be Montgomery County. In fact, we like not being Montgomery, Montgomery County but it does influence the incoming of businesses. How it affected me was that typically my business day was that I would do a thousand images in Washington. I would come home and I would upload those businesses, those images, I'd edit, edit them, I'd upload them in about an hour. I came here and I continued the business. I knew I was closing it, I was retiring, but I, would, I continued the business while I was here and it would take about 12 hours to do the same upload that took me an hour in Montgomery County. It really necessitated that I close my business. The simple reason it's not simply a matter of time. If it were simply a matter of time, I would not have minded doing it. But when you upload images over 12 hours, you also have severe degradation of those images. You have significant breakage of the images. You're not doing 12 hours, it's 25, four hours of figuring which images got ruined in the process. The other experience we had was that my daughter, and so I followed the project anticipating that Centerville was going to be a problem. I knew that Centerville from the very beginning was going to be a problem. In, the, in fiber, you look for about a four to five year return on investment. We're looking at a much longer return on investment for them. I would like to have heard more of the numbers, and I told them that in the hallway. I would like to have heard more about what that return on investment looks like. It looks closer to eight here, and that's when the company gets very tempted to walk away, and that's my worst fear, is that they'll walk away and it'll permanently impact our economic development. So I would really urge you to consider that this is vision. This is part of our future, and working with them, they're sincere, they're intent, we just need to get them to talk more about the numbers. My daughter this summer, was, this year, was here with me in, Montgomery, in, in the county, and then during the pandemic, she took one of her college, her university courses here. And she's had a strong academic career. It was a course at Harvard. Um, she went into the course with a 3.7 and she came out of the course disqualified. And the reason she did was that she had just reached organizational behavior. So she's in a management program and she had just reached organizational behavior. It requires, uh, most universities requires a great deal of presentation and case work. And at five o'clock, she would log on after she, came, she got out of work at the courthouse, she would come home, she would log on to her class and break down. The consequence for Jackie, I was very proud of her. I'm almost done, I was very proud of her. She didn't flip out. She's back in that course again this year and she's fine. But the reality is that this is a real example of a child who's talented really getting screwed by something that really should have happened already. If any of you have any doubt in your mind that one of your children will have this level of talent, don't for a moment. There's all of you, whether it's in the arts or whether it's going to be in the sciences, our children will thrive on this and they won't start thriving after their feet reach the floor. They're going to start thriving during grammar school, elementary school and middle school. So I just urge you all to see the vision in this, both economically but also for our children. Um, and really pursue it and work with these guys in a respectful manner. Um, they mean well. They need to tell us more about the numbers. I know that this was a little light on numbers, but I think they should be, we should be working together. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are any others for Citizens Forum? Next, we're going to move to uh, Council Roundtable. Anania? Um, so only, I had two things. I just wanted to uh, say that I was thought it was awesome how many people came out and spoke about the trail and I'm definitely someone who wants to see that trail be part of Carter Farm. Um, and then besides that, I had a question for our town acting town manager <laughs> regarding our trash service awesome. uh, company. Did you get a lot of calls yesterday about people not getting their trash picked up? Yes, okay. a lot today uh, and a lot yesterday as well. Um, and we've, we've been in contact, I've already um, had a, a call where we're going to meet with um, the owner. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. I, they didn't come down my street, so I know that. Um, and I just had neighbors 
coming over mm -hmm. with their complaints. Welcome to the council. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That fool. yeah. And and we were in communication. I know um, our front office were very quick to to ensure that they made contact with the company. And we were just advised that, you know, they had some short staffing and yeah. I think they came out but, today, but just wanted to make yeah. sure it was known. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Keel. A lot of people have been asking about the tax increase and they, they want it explained in a simple way so they can understand it. Is there any way we can send something out? like an email or a graph or something and say would, to explain it better to them. I, tr I explain it, but they, they just don't understand. I, I think we're going to work on, Bob has been study? talking about that, a letter. Yeah. Well, I, I came up, well, I've, been, <laughs> I've been like you. I live in Symphony Village. Uh, every time I walk down the street, mm -hmm. um, and I think I came up with a simple answer. And I, and I credit my wife. If you have a $300,000 appraised house, okay, at 13 cents a thousand, that comes to approximately $390. $390. Hmm. How many days in a year? 365. That comes to less than a cup of coffee a day. I mean, that, I, I, when, it, when she came and told me that, I said, wow, that's pretty, you know. If you want something simple. I, I, I think that people can do the math. I think what Jeff is saying is, what are we spending it on and why do we need to be spending yes. that money? Yes. And, and I, I believe that we are going to come up with that. I, I don't know when it will go out, but yeah. I, 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 believe I, I also, I also to piggyback on Jefferson, I'm next. Do you finished? Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm good. My comment is I tell them of our rigorous budget, the way we went through it together as a team, and we worked with our department heads. And the thing that struck me was the importance of taking care of our employees, not just monetarily, but their safety of their work environment and their productivity mm -hmm. when if you look at our capital budget it reflects that and i say that to, and then on top of that i uh, with the, our police department i make a point and i said you know how much it takes to retrain or you know a police officer outfit them etc and all of a sudden i get this look like oh yeah you're right I said, we have been in the past a revolving door in a certain way, both in our police and in our other operations. And I'll just say eight times out of 10, I've gotten, they're not happy, but then I tell them, and, and don't take offense to anybody, but I tell them we put our big, big boy pants and big girl pants on and we made a tough decision. And it, and I'll stand by it, and I'll talk with anybody anytime yes. about how we did this and why we did it. And I'm not even going to mention the people that normally sit at this dais, dais, and what they did to us. Alrighty, you got anything else for Carolyn? Can, has something she'd like? Yeah, to say. I wanted to say that um, Karen, um, our finance officer, is actually preparing okay. information to send out. Okay, thanks. So, all right, uh, Vice President Klein. <laughs> he didn't forget you. I got that in bold on my, on my agenda here. <laughs> <laughs> Tattooed on you. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Tattoo. I just, there are a lot, of, and fortunately, I am, as, as Council Member Hardy said, you know, very confident in our decision to this point, and I'm willing to defend it with just about anybody on the same grounds as he mentioned. But there is a lot of distaste in this town still about the Liberty and Commerce Street project. Mm -hmm. And there is a important job that all five of us have to do to ensure the accountability that something like that doesn't happen again. Absolutely. 
Yes. And I think, you know, the, the, as we look ahead to future infrastructure work, to dotting our I's and crossing the T's of, the, of who the consultants we have working on this stuff are, and keeping our finger on the pulse actively of these jobs, because I'm going to go so far as to say the town council of Centerville as a body cannot afford to have another experience like that. Uh, and you see this erosion in the comp you know, people's confidence in their town council and their government. And it doesn't matter that four of us are new. That doesn't matter to anybody. It's this is fresh in people's minds. I think we have to understand that. They look at the Liberty and Commerce Street project. They look at the cost overruns, which frankly were, were indefensible to not know that that was what that was going to cost and not know that it was going to be that far over earlier in the process. Did the project need to get done? There's no question about that, right? But we, needed to, we need to do a better job of explaining what we're doing to people. We need to make our budget accessible to everyone. It's become clear to me that the budget process, you, you, we have to get this stuff, these documents online sooner in the process because I think we're asking people to look, and this is, you know, we all talk about running on communications and that's been really hard to figure out. I ran on that as much as anybody else. Really hard to figure out how to get information to people on, on their timeline, where they want to see it, when they want to see it, and get them to look at it and pay attention to it. That's really hard to do. People are busy. But we have to do a better job of getting this stuff in front of people in a way. I mean, I can tell you right now, uh, this, this budget that we have right here is, is uh, opaque, I guess is a, probably the gentlest way you could put it. It's 30 pages. What are we spending money on? What are we prioritizing? Where is this tax increase going? Those are the kinds of narratives we have to be focused on telling here. And to just say, here's a document, you figure it out, is we just cannot do that anymore. We owe people better than that. And to be able to, to come along with us on this five-week adventure where we're meeting every week, and it's going to be important that they know you have the latest version of this thing. But we've got to get it up for people to be able to see it. And it's got to be graphic in nature. I don't mean capital G graphic, uh, visual in nature. It's got to be visual in nature. Revenues, expenditures, real simple. People don't care whether we have 50 different sources of revenue. People don't care if we have, uh, what's a general budget versus a, an enterprise budget or a capital budget? People don't know that. People don't understand that. I would argue there's people up here that don't understand the difference between that. Maybe I'm one of them. This needs to be boiled down badly. And I think it's, a, it's incumbent upon all of us. So I'll, I'll stop and just say uh, there's been some assumptions made in correspondence with the town that we did, this is just the easy way out, right? Or we didn't do our due diligence. And I just want to speak on behalf of everybody sitting up here that I think we did. I think we did our due diligence. I think we did the hard work. And this is, I would argue, the harder way out. <laughs> yeah. The easy way out would be to pass the buck again. The easy way out would be to say, let's talk about LEOPS next year. Let's put off police vehicles till next year. Let's put off some of these other things till next year. Maybe the next council. Somebody else can figure this stuff out. <laughs> but speaking for myself, I didn't, get, didn't run for this job to avoid difficult decisions. I just, it frustrates me to get emails saying, uh, questioning our ethics. We heard that tonight. Questioning the amount of time we put into this. I mean, this has kept, I think, all of us up at night, but I'll speak for myself. It's kept me up at night. Uh, and I want to remind people that there's no exemption for town council members in paying these tax rates either. Right. So my family gets to pay them too. And we're ready to do that. I just felt strongly compelled to say some of those things. I'm glad that I called on you. Thank I agree 100%. And I've been saying for a long time, that's the hardest thing to do. The hardest thing to do is, is that. So I, I, 
I totally agree. The thank only other you, comment, thank you, Steve. The only other comment I wanted to make is that I fully support the Carter Farm Perimeter Trail. Uh, that's something that is just super important to me, and and I think it's 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 got to go. So, I will accept the motion to. Uh, we heard a lot of comments tonight about that, and at the session where they presented their plan, yeah, I said that it was not unanimous that we needed a perimeter trail. Clearly, uh, it should be. <laughs> And, uh, so I will go along, you know, if I'm the holdout, uh, and if any of that effort was targeted at me, <coughs> I will say uh, let's get a perimeter well, trail. I think I, on that, I think we can work with them is what I, I believe. Just like this council has worked together with our department heads, and I am proud of us that we have moved forward. We left the past behind us, and we have done the job. We were elected for. All right. Here, I, I well, appreciate I, what you said. I thought we were going to get beat up about raising the tax tonight, and it was more about the perimeter trail than anything. <laughs> Wait till next meeting. Uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> we're in trouble next meeting, right? <laughs> yes. I, I think it, I think it's clear, and I appreciate you saying that, Steve. And and I'm glad to you know I think the yeah. council has, has spoken that that we need that perimeter trail. So I will accept the motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second. second? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, everybody.